We have a full agenda, so I want to make sure we have we have enough time to get to everything. I think uh, Yasmin, or is Yasmin going to call the roll, or is Gina? I'll be taking the roll. This is Yasmin. Okay, great. Thank you. Foley? Corrales? Here. Esparza? Cohen? Davis? Here, and I think uh, I think I'm Cohen. I'm here. Is here. Yeah, I'm here. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, so, looking at the work plan, it looks like we need a motion to. Um, we're deferring something. What is it? The, the stormwater permit status report, right? We need a motion to defer that. Uh, so moved on the uh, review of the work plan change. Thank you. Second. All right, can we get roll on that? Corrales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. And Davis? Yes. Thank you. And Chair, I don't know if uh, Blair had his hand up for that item, but. Oh, thank you. I didn't even think about that. You can tell it's Monday. Um, Blair, go ahead. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Thanks a lot for noticing myself and uh, yeah, I think when items are deferred and if they haven't been presented before a council or committee before, they definitely have to have a public comment time. So thank you for offering public comment. And it's just, overall, it's just a nice thing to do. So thank you. I simply uh, had my hand raised, uh, if nothing else, for this item to simply ask yourselves that I would like to speak on consent. And uh, yeah, if you can prepare yourselves for that. Uh, I, okay. I will talk about, yeah, this issue on the uh, upcoming agenda item. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so next is the consent calendar. So I think why don't we just go ahead and, and talk to Blair or have Blair speak before we take that item. Go ahead, Blair. Thank you. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman. Um, 
Yeah, uh, for this, this is air quality uh, monitoring efforts. I just wanted to remind of all the incredible good work uh, that, you know, there's a lot of technology that can be involved with air quality monitoring. And that I hope you're just working on that, uh, you know, the technology for these projects, they collect a lot of data and a lot of surveillance things that uh, it can be more than air quality. So I, I hope you have a good, uh, public policies in place for for this uh, technology that will be a part of the air quality monitoring systems, and that someone like myself can you know uh, ask yourselves at City Hall, can I look at the public policies? Can I look exactly what are the technology uh, guidelines for for such a process uh, as this, and just to be aware of that you know that it, it's nothing secretive or illegal or you know, has to be deep state government secrets. It can just be a real shared process. And uh, I hope we're learning how to do that and work in peace and work in the ideas of good open democracy. Uh, the two really work well together and offer a really hopeful, sustainable idea of what our future can be. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I'll move approval of consent. Thank you, Council Member Perales. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Council Member Foley. Can we get the roll on the consent calendar? Foley? Aye. Perales? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Yes. Thank you. All right, that passes and we will move on to our meaty part of the agenda. We have uh, many reports to committee today, starting with the annual transportation system safety report and vision zero update. John Risto, do you wanna kick it off? Yes, thank you, chair and committee, John Risto, director of transportation. Yes, this is a media item with a lot of information with me yeah. today that's gonna to do the presentation is Jesse Mintz Roth, our vision zero program manager and Lieutenant Anaya from San Jose Police Department. So I'm just going to get going right away with uh, Jesse. Are you ready to go? Thank you. Yes. Could everyone see the presentation? Yes. yes. Great. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Jesse Mintz-Roth, and I'm the Vision Zero Program Manager here at the Department of Transportation. And, and um, in today's presentation, we are going to cover um, the 2020 national data analysis uh, for traffic fatalities and injuries um, compared, well, much more specifically focused on the San Jose data um, and also give an update of the Vision Zero Action Plan. So 2020 has been an unusual year as we're all aware. And so we are very interested to know how it has gone, not only here, but also um, in other Vision Zero cities and across the state and country. And so um, this graph that is from the National Safety Count Council shows for 2020 for each state, um, how traffic fatalities basically fared. And so you can see that states that are shown in orange, such as California, um, have seen uh, an increase. And so California's increase is uh, 5%. Um, and so then looking, as you may have learned at San Jose's numbers, which went down in 2020, uh, we're interested to see how other cities in the area um, compare. So um, San Jose's traffic fatalities went down from 60 in 2019 to 49 in 2020, which is a 18% reduction. And so far as we can tell from other Vision Zero cities, that's a very good direction. Um, Los Angeles went down 3%, San Francisco stayed the same. Um, Austin, Portland, and New York City all went up. Um, and so we're very interested uh, to see. Um, then looking more specifically at our 10-year traffic fatality trend, that many of you have seen this uh, graph before, um, but specifically San Jose's traffic fatalities doubled between 2012 and 2015. Um, went down and then hit another peak, that same peak, again in 2019. So this year, 2020 data, um, having gone down is great, but it's also still within the range of recent years. 
Um, and so speaking more generally about 2020, we don't really know whether it is a, um, a new trend, the beginning of a new trend, or it, whether it's a one-year aberration. So we, we will see. Um, but looking at our major uh, indicators, crashes went down, injuries went down, fatal and severe injuries, uh, which we discuss here as KSI every so often in the slides, went down. Fatalities went down, but fatalities caused by speeding went up. Um, and one of the things that I like to say, or that I think is important to say when I present on these numbers, is that I think that when we talk about the numbers, they can seem very removed. Um, but these numbers are people, they are our neighbors, they are our families. So um, I just want to uh, acknowledge that difficulty when we talk about these numbers. Um, so traffic fatalities by month. These are new charts that we've generated this year um, through the new Vision Zero Task Force, which I'll discuss in a few slides. You can see cumulative injury crashes by month. The line in blue is 2020. Um, and if you compare it to the previous five years, 2015 through 2019, the first three months of the year before the shelter in place began, was in range. And then as the shelter in place began um, and continued, the line goes below the range of the five previous years. But if you look more specifically at the fatal and severe injuries, KSI, they stay within range of the last five years. Um, and so too with fatalities by month, they are also within range. Um, and so if we look at traffic fatalities by street user type, um, there is the growth notably in people hit while walking that begins in 2017 and actually continues through this year, even though um, from 2019 to 2020, the number has gone down. So people hit while walking are the biggest group of traffic fatalities in San Jose, despite their small mode share. Um, and motor vehicle occupants are the second largest. And then uh, people hit while cycling are a relatively smaller number, um, as well as people on motorcycle. Uh, one of the major things that, I, that we want to comment on is the decrease from 2019 to 2020 of people hit while walking. And when we look at their median ages, uh, they're also the oldest uh, subgroup of users. So their median age in the last five years is 56 years old. Based on what we know about people sheltering in place, these two slides together show that people who are older uh, stayed home more likely in 2020. Um, and the other older, older age group um, is people hit while cycling. Um, and so uh, those two groups taken together have been informing our uh, initiatives on outreach to focus on um, doing outreach to older adults. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about speeding. That is the area that has grown. Um, and so you can see here that if we look at the top known factors leading to fatal and severe injuries in San Jose in the last five years, the pie chart on the left, uh, speeding is the biggest one, and it is by far number one. So it is more than twice as much as people hit from red light running. Um, and if you look at the growth in fatalities, which is the, uh, the chart on the right, the dark green, uh, six people were hit, were uh, killed due to speeding in uh, 2019, is that speeding as the primary factor in the crash. Um, in 2020, that number grew to 13, twice, more than twice as much. And then if you look at the overall number, 49, this represents 27% um, of all traffic fatalities in 2020. Um, but if you look at severe injuries, people who um, a, a, an ambulance was necessary to take them to the hospital, the number is much higher. So um, basically, we want to just talk about that growth in uh, traffic fatalities caused by speeding, um, and just that speeding is by far the number one uh, cause. So the Vision Zero Action Plan, uh, which many of you are familiar with, is now a little over a year old um, and has six areas, which we're going to touch on on each of the next slides. The first area is to build robust data analytics tools. And this year, 
we were really excited to bring on a transportation specialist to uh, perform data analysis. We also recently started our uh, startup in residence contract with Urban Logic, which is building a uh, web dashboard for us to bring in data that the city has of the, of the types that we've been able to look at before that we typically can look at at GIS, but also new types of data, such as data collected um, through new technology pilots. Um, another of our data projects is the Smart City Near Miss uh, image, which you see on this slide. This is from our work with Verizon Smart Communities. And this slide focuses on the intersection in the pilot. There are only three intersections in this pilot, but the one with the most pedestrian uh, traffic. And so um, what this image shows, and we presented this in more detail to the Smart Cities Committee in February, is that at this intersection of Meridian Avenue and West San Carlos, that 50% uh, of near miss events are occurring on the south leg of the intersection, that 60% of them involve vehicles going northbound, and that 83% of them involve people walking outside the crosswalk area. Um, the fourth uh, project that we want to highlight on this slide is cloud-based radar speed signs. Some of these are upgrades and some of them are new locations. The second area of the Vision Zero um, action plan is to form a Vision Zero task force, which we started in September of 2020. Um, and the second meeting was December of 2020. The third meeting, which was focused on data, was in March of 2021, and the final meeting of this year will be June 4th. Uh, these meetings are public, and they are advertised on the city's website, um, and they're also on visionzerosj.org for anyone who is interested in attending the June 4th meeting. It's made up of 20 task force members, two city council, uh, chair is Raul Perales, vice chair, is uh, Pam Foley. And then we have nine city department decision makers and six county department decision makers, as well as three local advocate groups. And for the uh, strat for strategized traffic enforcement, I'm going to turn over the microphone to uh, Lieutenant Dave Anaya from the police department. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, Jesse. Can you guys hear me? All right, yeah. perfect. perfect, thank you. So I'm gonna discuss some of the traffic enforcement that we're doing and just provide some numbers today um, and kind of go through Q1 through Q4 just to give you an idea of um, what we did and, and why the numbers are so, so different uh, because this past year was very unique in the way we conducted our enforcement. Um, we really had to change our response uh, during the pandemic and we really come to come to you know, come to grips, if you will, with with just operating in a, in a different way than we were used to. So um, the citations and, and warnings fluctuate as a result of that. So, uh, you know, we had to, we had to comply with the uh, county health order and the shelter in place. And, and then we also had issues with uh, with vehicles and numbers of vehicles that were on the roadway during the shelter in place. So um, our enforcement numbers are quite different than they would normally look like. So as you can see in Q1 to Q, uh, I'm sorry, Q1, our citation numbers are 2,394, and then we have 400 warnings for a total of 2,800. And then Q2, the same, I mean, very similar numbers, a little bit less. Then when we get into um, Q3, when we start looking at, again, county health orders, pandemic, um, civil unrest, and things of that nature to where we have to target our enforcement or our, our resources elsewhere, um, and the officers just aren't on the street as much, you see those numbers deplete significantly in Q3 and then uh, start to raise up again in Q4. So those numbers that you see are, are really a direct reflection of what we have um, in manpower, number one, number two in our enforcement strategies and, uh, and how we deploy our officers and, and number three, uh, dealing with some of the protests and again, civil unrest that we had within the city where we had to utilize our, our traffic enforcement resources elsewhere um, to deal with uh, some of the problems that were occurring in the city. Um, interestingly enough, uh, I did pull some of the stats for Q1 for this year just to show you where we're at today. And, um, and again, not on, not on Jesse's slide, but just to throw these numbers out, because we did resume back to somewhat normal operations, 
uh, our stat numbers are, are significantly higher for Q1 of this year, um, 2,761 citations and 870 warnings. Um, again, a direct reflection of manpower and then also being able to go back to the way our, our usual enforcement uh, model should look. Um, some of the challenges that we had during, during uh, the pandemic were obviously the safety of the traveling motorist, uh, the safety of the officers who were making the contact, and we wanted to really minimize uh, contacts during a, during a good portion of that time, um, except in real egregious type situations. Now, the officers were still present in the intersections uh, that were problematic, and to try to be a visual deterrent, but we really had to just look at our overall deployment model and change that a little bit. Um, and again, you know, the citations and things of that nature take more time. I mean, the officers have to properly sterilize their equipment. They utilize uh, somewhat of an iPad type device uh, when they issue a citation. So uh, the motorists are touching that device. The officers are touching their driver's licenses and things of that nature. So we just went into a, a whole different deployment that we were just weren't accustomed to. And, and, and that, that was, took some growing pains for us. So uh, we're getting back to resuming normal operations. So those numbers are gonna increase again. And, and, and um, again, the, the warnings, we like the warnings, we like educating the public, but at, at the same time, um, sometimes that educational piece, sometimes a, a citation is warranted and, and we issue those, those, those citations as well. So um, as you go down to our projected, our uh, project updates, we have an upcoming uh, e-site acquisition and RFP that we've been working with uh, DOT hand in hand to see what type of needs that they have for analytical purposes and, um, and also looking at our own internal needs as to what the officer needs and the end user needs in the field uh, to um, complete citations or electronic e-site with electronic citations in the field um, to expedite the process. And, and again, uh, the analytics come into play and um, working collaboratively with, with DOT and the Vision Zero staff for those analytics so we can deploy more targeted enforcement and just be more efficient with the way that we do our job and, and working hand in hand with what DOT needs and what Vision Zero needs to work those corridors and work the areas where we're having the most problems. So that's, um, that's my update for uh, strategized enforcement and I'll go back to you, Jesse. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, um, the next slide. Um, so in this area, we're also wanting to give an update on our uh, legislative agenda. Uh, this year, we are co-sponsoring two bills in assembly. The first one, AB 43, uh, would give uh, municipalities in California more flexibility to lower the speed limit on high injury network streets. The second one, uh, AB 550, is the speed safety system pilot program, which would allow five cities in California, San Francisco, San Jose, Oakland, Los Angeles, and one Southern California city to pilot speed safety systems beginning July 1, 2022, ending January 1, 2027. Um, and they could be located on a high injury network street or near schools, senior zones, public parks, or recreational centers. The fourth area of the Vision Zero Action Plan is to increase community outreach. And so um, the Strategic Communications RFP, which is part of the Vision Zero Action Plan, um, Council awarded this to uh, MIG, um, a planning and outreach firm, and it's anticipated to begin uh, around June or sometime this summer. Uh, we also have a project where we are doing safety outreach at eight locations. It's sponsored by uh, California Office of Traffic Safety, a grant from there, and the consultant on this project is Fair and Peers, and it will be at eight locations in San Jose. Um, we also recently put up signs similar to the ones that you see on the right side of this slide. And um, they say, look out when it's dark out, and we put these up during the months of the year when it is darkest, when um, we typically see a spike in fatalities due to daylight savings time. We've also been increasing Vision Zero coordination um, on the county level at, with the Traffic Safe Communities Network run by the Public Health Department. Um, in the region, as part of the Vision Zero Working Group, just started by the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, and also on the state level through the North American City Transportation uh, officials group called the California City Transportation Initiative. 
the fifth area of the Vision Zero Action Plan is quick build safety projects. And so you can see an outreach poster here that was posted on the street at Center Road showing the types of work that people can anticipate in these areas. And there is a list of all of the projects that we are scheduled to do in the next year or so on this slide. Um, and the final area of the Vision Zero Action Plan is to prioritize resources on high fatal and severe injury corridors and districts. And so looking beyond just the Vision Zero corridors, but also thinking about the districts that they're in, um, we recently submitted an application to Caltrans. Um, they have a program called the Sustainable Transportation Planning Grant. And so for the high uh, KSI districts, which are districts three, five, six, and seven, we submitted an application to uh, basically look at all of these areas a lot more holistically uh, to look at the networks of areas that people use. Um, and so the map on the right is one of the maps that we created and submitted for that grant opportunity. We also applied to a grant for basically the same program, King Road, Districts 3, 5, 7, and 8. And another uh, holistic look at intersections in San Jose is that we are beginning our citywide collision review program, uh, which takes several months that involves the staff members of the department looking at the intersections with the most fatal and severe injuries and recommending improvements at them. And so uh, in closing, this presentation had the summary of 2020 traffic fatality trends and progress on the 2020 Vision Zero Action Plan. And so we'll move to questions. Thank you. We'll go to the members of the public first. We've got a few hands uh, being raised. We'll start with Blair. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thank you uh, for allowing me to start. Um, yeah, thank you for this report. Um, I'm interested how, uh, you know, uh, San Jose uh, simply has a real long history of, uh, you know, they they how they use surveillance and technology. And uh, it's actually, you know, in, in, in they, in the history is one of a, a real restrained way to use it. You know, there's a real respect for civil rights and civil protections. I know that with Vision Zero and neighborhood safety issues with all the four and 5G now being placed in local neighborhoods, it's gonna have a ton of surveillance technology involved. You know, all of that is good neighborhood safety, and that will be helping the Vision Zero process. And that, and that is the idea of civil rights and civil protections to some. I think, you know, as they're building this and as they espouse the importance of this, I, I hope they can realize the importance of open public policy ideas for all this new technology and for neighborhood safety issues that really, it, they can work together. These are concepts that can work together. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. And as I think that's just an incredibly important lesson uh, we take forward into this era, how to leave COVID-19 and to really address vision zero as not just enforcement issues, but issues of uh, uh, holistic ideas, what was mentioned uh, at the end of the speech today. You know, I mean, um, Vancouver, Canada, Guadalajara, Mexico, if you study their vision zero programs, that's about street vending. That's about having, you know, opening up whole cities on a weekend for community activity. It's really important to get the whole community involved in a process. And we're talking about love and we're talking about our community harmony and what makes us unique as a democracy. So I think open public policies can really help these concepts and, um, yeah, with technology. So really, really work at it and, and consider these things. And uh, thanks again for your time. Thank you. Next speaker is John Cordes. Thank you, dear San Jose City Council members. My name is John Cordes. I'm an advocate for the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition and a Vision Zero Task Force member. Thank you for listening to me today. I wanna to start by thanking you again for funding $6.7 million toward the first year of implementing the five-year Vision Zero Plan in 2020. It's a wonderful step toward the goal of reducing deaths and serious injuries on our roadways in San Jose. It is money that is being well spent. 
San Jose is currently improving the intersection of Story and Jackson for $1.8 million and $11 million towards a uh, quick build infrastructure on Center and Fruitvale Avenues. During the COVID pandemic, more people are walking and riding bikes and streets than ever before. This makes implementing the Vision Zero Action Plan even more important. The main goal is to implement 56 miles of protected uh, quick build infrastructure. And we'd like to see the funding for that increased. Um, the current funding proposal is for $2 million for data analysis and outreach and $3.5 million for quick build projects. We'd like to see the funding for the quick build projects increase to at least $5 million and therefore a total Vision Zero budget for FY21-22 to be $7.15 million. Yes, we acknowledge this is a tough year financially, but please increase funding to make walking and biking and riding safer, particularly with increasing speeds, it's more important now than ever. In 2020, there were seven fatalities of people who were riding a bicycle and they've already been four so far in 2021. So 21 is not showing any improvements for this vulnerable community. More funding can only help. Please uh, thank you for co-sponsoring AB43 and AB550. We'd also like to see San Jose support AB1238, the Freedom to Walk Act. There has been increased uh, fatal collisions in the past year involving people walking and biking across streets. These collisions and deaths are not the fault of the victims. It is. Thank you. Next speaker is Nikita. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Nikita Sinha, and I'm the Walk San Jose program manager with California Walks and a lifelong resident of San Jose. Thank you to staff for the presentation and the hard work on the Vision Zero program. Over the past year, despite the challenges of COVID-19, DOT has implemented Vision Zero safety improvements on high injury streets across the city. Still 49 people were killed on our streets last year. As we enter the second year of the Vision Zero action plan, I urge you to support additional funding and resources for DOT to continue $5 million of quick build safety, pro, uh, safe, safety projects in the 2021 to 22 fiscal year. I wanna request that as these projects are completed, staff reports on the use of Vision Zero funds in either these meetings or the quarterly Vision Zero task force meetings. I also ask that staff and council members consider AB 1238, the Freedom to Walk Act, which would repeal California jaywalking laws to protect vulnerable pedestrians against arbitrary, racially biased, pretextual policing, burdensome fees and fines, and unnecessary and potentially lethal interactions with law enforcement. Jaywalking laws disproportionately affect black and brown people in low income neighborhoods, which typically lack adequate crossing, lighting, and sidewalks. Repealing this outdated and discriminatory law is an important step for Vision Zero, and I urge you to support AB 1238. Thank you for your time and for the opportunity to comment. Thank you. Next is Victoria. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, good afternoon, council members. My name is Victoria Partida and I'm a resident of District 7. Thank you for the opportunity to comment and to comment and to staff for your hard work on the annual Vision Zero report. This past year, we lost 49 of our neighborhoods to traffic related deaths and countless others were injured and will be physically and financially burdened by their injuries for years to come. I know that I lost my own mother. All right, Victoria is gonna um... Raise your hand again when you're when you're ready to speak, Victoria. I know you got something to deal with on the other end there, so totally understand that. Um, why don't we go to Brian? Hello, uh, my name is Brian Prescott. Uh, I live in downtown San Jose, District Three, uh, and I'm a member of the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition. I'd like to thank the committee for opening this meeting to the public, and thank staff for the presentation. Um, so. I'm lucky enough to live in a neighborhood downtown where a lot of Vision Zero projects have been implemented. And these mean a lot to me personally. I don't own a car, so I walk and I bike everywhere I go every single day, unless I'm on like the bus or Caltrain. Um, and having safer streets nearby makes me a freer person. It makes my world bigger. There's just literally more places that I can get to. And it gives me a stronger sense of place because 
home is where I feel safe on my feet and on my bike. Um, unfortunately, the way that our transportation budget looks doesn't always prioritize making our streets safer. After five or six years of a Vision Zero plan, uh, deaths from traffic violence have barely budged. And it's hard to see that my tax money, spend plenty of it, is often getting put on projects that make streets faster, which we know makes the streets more deadly. Um, Vision Zero projects this year are at risk in the budget. And so while we have a Vision Zero plan, which, why, which I applaud, our budget is a Vision 50 budget where we're saying that we're okay with traffic violence as it exists. Um, I'm here to ask that the city allocate $5.5 million at a minimum for Vision Zero quick build projects this year. I thank you for your attention to safety improvements so far, but ultimately my life is in your hands and I'm asking you to deal with it trustworthily. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Next is Josh Quigley. Um, thank you. This is Josh Quigley from Save the Bay. Um, I just wanted to state uh, in support of the Vision Zero investments, um, because over the past year, I've had the chance to talk with many of you or your staffs about our interest in San Jose incorporating nature and green infrastructure into the city streets, both for climate resilience and to enhance pedestrian safety. We actually specifically have called out the Vision Zero project as an area where climate resilience and safety improvements should be in alignment. And so to give a little bit more support to this effort, I just want to say that safer streets are not only important for the well-being and safety of San Jose residents, but are integral to a more sustainable future as San Jose continues to grow. As the city becomes more dense, as we build more housing, hopefully, um, ways to avoid conflicts between cars and pedestrians need to be designed into the roadways. This helps not only ensure that the city can bring more people into existing neighborhoods safely, but do so in a way that doesn't add air and water pollution from more cars. The largest contributor to water quality pollution in the Bay is from roadway runoff. So our cities and streets need to encourage people to get out of their cars, but to do so safely. Ultimately, we hope that the city will work to transform the streets in ways that promote safety and incorporate new designs that simultaneously help the city become more climate resilient, as the, climate, uh, as the council indicated during the roadmap process back in March. <laughs> But in the short term, these Vision Zero investments and the Quick Build project specifically are important to begin the process of changing the city's approach to street design. And so we hope the city will continue to support this project. Thanks. Thank you. Let's go back to Victoria. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, I was um, mentioning that I had lost my own mom. Um, she actually got ran over and got killed. Um, and I wanted to um, ask to first allocate funding for a second year of Vision Zero safety improvements, including quick build improvements, increased traffic safety awareness, and educational campaigns. I'm sorry. And co increased community outreach to identify what improvements are still needed and where funding has not been allocated. Second, update the public on the use of Vision Zero funds through mm. quarterly task force meetings. I strongly urge you to support, I strongly urge you to honor those who have been killed in crashes by taking immediate actions towards making infrastructure improvements. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Very sorry for your loss. Next uh, is Teresa Doe. Hi, good afternoon, council members. My name is Teresa Doe and I am the program coordinator at Walk San Jose and a resident of District 7. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to comment and thank you staff for your hard work on the annual Vision Zero report. Uh, my family and I, we've lived in San Jose for the past 20 years. And this year, one of the major roads we frequently drive on, Center Road, um, underwent some major safety improvements with new bike lanes, uh, safer turns and median islands to name a few changes. Uh, and these changes have not gone unnoticed. I've had many conversations with my friends and my family about how these safety improvements have made them feel safer while walking, biking, and also driving. And we all agree that improvements like these, um, when seen on Center Road in more parts of San Jose will make the city safer for people who walk, roll, bike, and drive. 
With this in mind, I'm urging Council to allocate funding for a second year of the Vision Zero Action Plan, including at least $5 million in the 2021 to 22 budget for quick build improvements on the 11 miles of priority safety corridors. The safety improvements on Center Road have brought us one step closer to becoming a safe, safer and more walkable city uh, where everyone has the freedom to move regardless of their age and ability and they feel safe doing so. Thank you. Thank you. Next is uh, Blythe Young. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Blythe Young. I'm the community advocacy director for the American Heart Association here in the Bay Area. I wanna thank you for your hard work on the annual Vision Zero report and past investments that you've made. Um, traffic related deaths and injury remains an issue for San Jose and continued investment is needed. We know that safe movement is an important factor in reducing chronic disease and improving cardiovascular health. One positive impact of the pandemic is an increase of people getting outside to recreate prioritizing adequate funds can help San Jose residents recreate safely and live longer, healthier lives. The American Heart Association respectfully asks that you approve and expand a second year of Vision Zero funding to continue safety improvements, traffic safety awareness, and run some educational campaigns with vital community input. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Prince Zahoda. Um, hello, San Jose City Council. My name is Prince Zahota. I earned my Bachelor's of Science Degree in Just Studies from San Jose State University, and I am a judicial intern with Judge Socrates Peter Manukian of the County of Santa Clara Superior Court and Stanford Community Studies student. I just wanted to um, present my um, first comment with the City of San Jose City Council. Um, I'm a member of the City of San Jose. Um, I'm participating in um, my own research following my Bachelor's degree. Um, regarding my interest in studying and teaching politics. So I just wanted to um, share some of my studies as it relates to the, um, the San Jose International um, Airport, if, that, if that's okay with the city um, council. Please go ahead. Yes, so um, according to the Environmental Protection Agency, um, um, uh, Title 40, Code of Federal Regulations, Part 67 and 1068, um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions from air aircrafts um, contribute to climate change and, and endanger um, public health. And according to um, a California Environmental Quality Act report published in, in October of 2019, um, pages 85 and 92, we have the, um, the very aircrafts and, and the greenhouse gases that potentially could um, um, impact um, climate change and public health. I'm researching um, because I graduated from San Jose State University with no student debt. Um, I'm an intern with Judge Socrates, Peter Manukian of the County of Santa Clara Superior Court, and I'm a Stanford Community Studies student, and I'm researching politics, and part of what I want to do um, to, to, to study um, in more universities, universities is, is, is um, present my public comments pursuant to the City of San Jose Charter. So I thank you and appreciate your time and consideration. Thank you. Our next public speaker uh, is the phone number ending in 5140. You know what's bad for the environment? These roads that are being paved and there's they don't finish the manhole covers, right? They, they have a ring around the manhole where, you, you know, you're gonna, you know, crack your crack your uh, rim on or bust a tire, and then you got these roads that have been repaved for bikes, and there's no room for cars anymore, and it's terrible to have to make a left or right hand turn where these bike lanes are. But you got the bike lanes, you got the new pavement, but you can't finish the ring around the manhole cover. Cherry Avenue right now has 10 manhole covers that have not been finished yet. But you know what's finished are the bike lanes. You know what else isn't finished? Speak Lane. Speak Lane looks like a third world country. I think next time my car hits a pothole or an unfinished manhole cover, I'm urging everyone, including myself, to mail City Hall a bill for new alignment. If you pop a tire, 
get a new tire. The city needs to the city needs to be billed for the damages that are occurring because they refuse to fix the roads. They refuse to do anything. It's disgusting. And Pam Foley, I hope you're listening. Oh, Chair, you're on mute. Oh, thank you. Um, we had a speaker who put their hand down. So uh, we'll go to the committee, Council Member Perales. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you staff for the presentation on this item. Um, obviously very intimate with the work as the chair of the Vision Zero Task Force uh, and have appreciated working with you all um, on those efforts. And, uh, and, and I know my colleagues here are, are seeing some of these updates for um, the first time. And so there is, is a lot baked in here. Um, I wanted to bring up uh, an item uh, and a question in regards to some of the, uh, the last topics that we've had and actually ongoing at the task force, which was uh, in regards to collaboration. This last task force meeting we had a really uh, educational presentation from the coroner's office and emergency medical uh, services and uh, a discussion on uh, stakeholders sharing uh, data. And um, wanted to see since that meeting if there's been any progress in the efforts to data sharing um, and, and maybe streamlining that as well between the, the various agencies. Do you want me to respond now or should we take more questions? Tell me what you prefer. No, go, go ahead if you can respond now. Jeff. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, so we are working on data sharing with uh, the County Emergency Services Agency. They're the source of trauma hospital data. Um, the process will be long, but it's really great that they're clearly a willing data partner. So I think that we'll just be working on that for a bit. Um, but I, I would say it's encouraging. Um, I think that you're aware of our data sharing uh, desire um, and maybe slow response from the VTA. Um, and so at, at current, we have, we, have, we have definitely pinged them a few times. Um, and um, they had a recent issue with their email service that you're probably aware of. Um, and so since they just got their email back, um, currently they say that they're not authorized to share the data and I, we don't really know what that means. And so I've pushed them to explain that more. Um, and so we have a meeting with them coming up at the end of May where we intend to hopefully get a longer answer um, about what we can do to bring them to the place where they will share data with us. Um, so that's, that's where we are on our major data sharing questions. And as you know, we already have the data from the medical examiner corner and that data, uh, to be more specific for those of you who don't know is that's the definition of someone who's considered to be homeless, um, in our traffic fatalities, they have a very strict definition. And so we want to use their strict definition. Great, thank you. And uh, yes, I'm aware of, of some of the um, current circumstances that VTA is, is in, but uh, I think longer term, certainly of interest there. And, and I'll, I'll say that um, as a VTA board member as well, wearing that hat, that I'm happy to see if there's something that, that I can do on that board to try and, and create some authority if that's what's really lacking. Um, and, and be able to, to see where best to, to fit that in in a conversation um, with, um, with the VTA board, if indeed it looks like staff to staff, uh, we're having some challenges. So, uh, and we can continue that conversation as well through the Division Zero Task Force. Um, I was really pleased to hear uh, feedback on the quick build projects over in Center Road. I think 
you know, hearing directly from our community that is saying, hey, this this was great. We noticed the difference. We can, you know, we feel the difference, right? Um, I want to say thank you to the community member that came and spoke on that. That is the goal with these quick build safety projects, as we know, and, and hearing that direct feedback uh, is extremely important. And um, and I think just, just shows the value of this work uh, to our community. So um, looking forward, obviously, to more of those projects being able to come through um, in that regard, I know there's, and this has been an ongoing uh, demand and certainly interest from our community that we we fund even more um, of the quick build projects. So I wanted to hear from staff, say for instance, if we were able to increase the funding for quick build projects, uh, you know, a million dollars, $2 million, as was uh, asked for in the, the public comments, what is the capacity of staff um, to be able to actually implement those projects in the coming fiscal year? I know that was the challenge last year was that really uh, capacity wise, right? There's, there's so much we can do. So it wasn't merely a funding challenge. I wanted to see if, if staff could speak to that as we obviously have budget discussions coming up soon. So this is rather timely. Yeah, uh, council member, uh, really good question. John Risto, director of transportation. And let me start and then Lily Limsell might want to jump in. She's managing the quick build. But, you know, if, depending on how much there would be an increase, like a million dollars a year, we could probably handle that. That would be one to two other projects. And I think that's something that the team can probably deal with. Um, if you recall going back a couple of years when we were estimating an entire amount of funding that was much larger than this for if we wanted to really take on every one of the 17 corridors and do that, um, the amount of money in that was quite large. That that would start to be getting into something we would have to probably develop another team or two if we were going to really get large. But a million dollars a year in that kind of range, I think that's something that we could probably handle within the team that we have. Lily, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, Lily Lim, South Deputy Director of Traffic Safety and Operations. I would say that um, we would be prioritizing quick build projects alongside some of the other uh, safety priorities such as sideshow and race uh, deter deterrent work that council approved just recently. Um, so I think a million dollars certainly would be feasible for a couple more projects that just would extend our implementation a little bit of time with the current resource level. We also have several uh, delivery staff that is on a temporary overstrength basis and we would need to look at the structure of that team in order to deliver it. I think what's uh, been helpful in our delivery thus far that we've been able to tackle as many is because of the pavement program aligning our pavement program along with grant CIP projects uh, with our quick builds. The three things, all the stars lining up for those three help for us to get meaningful and significant uh, work out on the street, uh, but we certainly uh, could benefit from having the resources both fiscally and uh, staff resource wise. Okay, thank you. And I do know that obviously with, um, I think, near unanimous support uh, from the council on prioritizing the uh, enforcement and safety from sideshows, uh, there's crossover there in regards to some of these quick build uh, and, and safety quarters that we want to look at and um, and some of the sideshow um, investment that we may make uh, for the coming year. So I, I personally will be uh, chewing that over and, and having a conversation with my Budget Brown Act in regards to what um, we may want to see um, potentially be increased or included as well. Uh, right. So thank you for that. In regards to the um, uh, policy strategy and what's uh, happening up at the state with Assembly Bill 43 and, and 550. I know that uh, we had a public commenter mentioned uh, AB 1238. And so I wanted to see if that's something that staff had looked at as well. I'm not uh, too familiar with all the language. I know of, of what it's in general asking for, but I wanted to see if that's something that staff has looked at, including in regards to um, the policy strategy on Vision Zero as well. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that one. Laura might know. She's been actually tracking the other legislative items which are moving through the committees in Sacramento. Laura, do you know much about that? Um, I actually don't. I'm, I'm, I'm frantically pulling up the assembly bill to see if I can. Um, and and no worries, don't, I, don't, I don't want you to yeah. have to, 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 to answer that on the spot. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah. well, we will look at that. Yeah, we can have DOT and the IGR team look at it. It's not a position that we've taken thus far on that piece of legislation. It was referred from Assembly Transportation into the Appropriations Committee um, a few weeks ago, and it's sat there since. So I do think it has something to do related to the state budget. So more to come on that, but we can certainly report back um, and see how that aligns with the uh, legislative guiding principles. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate that. And um, again, I, I haven't... Uh, you know, dove into it myself. And that's why I was curious. And so I would love to have that conversation come back and maybe even um, at the upcoming Vision Zero uh, task force as well, if there's capacity for it. Um, so appreciate that. That's all my um, my questions. And so I will, um, I'll make a motion uh, at the moment and I don't have any other additions. So if my colleagues do, happy to obviously entertain those as well, but make a motion to uh, approve um, the annual transportation system uh, or yeah, system safety report and vision zero update. Second. Thank you. Council member Foley. Thank you. And thank you to staff for the presentation. Uh, like council member Perales, I've, I've heard a lot of this information before serving on the dis the vision nine task force. Sure we get uh, an advanced update on this and I, I'm grateful to actually serve on that committee. That uh, task force is really important because we are looking at the number of fatalities and serious injuries and 49, while it's a decrease from the year before, from 2019, it's, it's 49 too many, it's still unacceptable. So we need to do what we can to continue to make our streets safe. And that's the whole uh, focus of Vision Zero. I know there are several people, um, residents on this call who have lost loved ones. And Victoria, I'm so sorry for the loss of your mother recently. Um, I, I can't imagine. And uh, Brian, um, your quote, our li your life is in our hands. Um, I take that very seriously when it comes to pedestrian safety. So I have a question. Uh, I, I had a few questions that the council member Perales already asked regarding AB 1238 and funding uh, and capacity. But I have a question for you regarding outreach and uh, education of pedestrians in particular. I, 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 was, in, I was involved in a, a, a session the other day with uh, clients of Hope Services, and they asked me how they could be safe on the streets, walking around or waiting for the bus. And the comment, I don't know if they were talking, referencing COVID, but I responded that they should be dressing in colorful clothing and not wearing black when they're crossing the streets, when they're out and about. Are we, because that way drivers uh, can see them, are we doing anything to message that? What, uh, how are we reaching out to the community to message being safe on the streets? It takes, it, it, yes, we want the motorists to pay attention, absolutely. But we also need the pedestrians to be aware and watch for um, motorists who aren't paying attention to them. And if they're wearing black, it is, and it's raining, it's very difficult for a motorist to see them. It, it, so are we messaging that at all or how could we message that more? Um, so I would say that's an implicit message in some of the um, work that we've done, the look out when it's dark out campaign. Um, those, those signs are now on, I believe all of the Vision Zero corridors and um, the, the image which is behind me, but I can reshare for a moment if we want, shows all of the street users in yellow um, so while we didn't go sort of out of the way in the in that campaign to say where where loud colors, um, I, I, I think that it, I guess it's implied at this point. However, I would say for most questions of safety messaging, including this one, that we're about to bring on a uh, you know professional communications um, strategy team, and I think that it really. Um, uh -huh. Is useful to know what the messages are that people, you know, would suggest for those campaigns as we go into 
um, into bringing them on and deciding what the safety messaging campaign or campaigns will be. Um, and so that is definitely one that we could consider doing. Um, and so basically we're sort of at this point between the, where we have done many, many things uh, in-house ourselves, uh, including a lot of our own in-person outreach work. Um, I think many of you may have met Cordell Bailey, who's on our team and who does a lot of work in the districts. And um, he, we have had a lot of um, things that he gives out funded by the Office of Traffic Safety, um, including uh, flashlights and vests. Um, and so we have, you know, sort of on the ground given out a lot of uh, more visible types of things for people to wear when they're crossing the street or consider, you know, consider wearing in the future. Um, but I, hopefully as we sort of move from here towards having a professional outreach consultant to help us on these campaigns, we can think about, you know, all of the sort of ways that we haven't thought about yet to get that type of message out. Great. Thank you. The last question I had or comment I had is about the additional uh, uh, corridors that you're going to review and uh, being willing to look at other corridors that, not, that aren't uh, necessarily Vision Zero corridors, but have a high level of accidents such as Kirtner and Monterey as, as an example of one intersection that is a big intersection and uh, there was a fatality not too long ago. So I appreciate that you're looking into that. Um, with that, all of the West, my questions have been answered and I look forward to our next task force meeting in June. Thank you. Thank you, council members Sparza. Thank you, chair. Um, first off, I'd like to thank all the speakers to you know, for coming and speaking and sharing their stories. Um, it's really difficult and um, but you're doing it to lift up everybody else and to make things safer for others. And I, that's pretty amazing. Um, so I had um, a couple of questions. Oh, and, and before we actually get going, um, I also wanted to do a shout out. Somebody mentioned the Central Road build out. Um, uh, I, that there was a horrible fatality um, shortly before Christmas in 2019. Um, there had already been some Vision Zero meetings um, with the community before that. Um, and the DOT team in particular, um, Lily Lamb, uh, Lily, sorry, Lily Lim and Lamb Cruz and Jesse, um, we had a lot of meetings. Um, about how to make some changes in Central Road. And I especially want to give a shout out to the team. They spent several months doing some work, applying for state grants to make that one build out, you know, to make that build out work. And um, I just wanted to acknowledge the effort and the dedication and the heart that went into that because you know how important that was to the community. Um, so thank you. Um, I also had some questions. In TE, we've had a lot of discussions in particular about Vision Zero, about outreach on homelessness. Um, you know, unfortunately, we had another fatality recently on Kirtner and Monterey. Um, there's an encampment right next to that, right? I, I, the, the seniors who live in the housing development across from the plant, um, they, they report they're able to cross the street. Um, so I'm not hearing, we've asked, I know folks that live there, I've asked them um, because it is one of the things that has come up on Central Road, for example, is do folks have enough time to cross the street? Um, I have seen folks, um, you know, who maybe were on a substance. Um, I'm not sure. I've seen them try and cross Monterey. Um, I've actually witnessed it, um, for, you know, who were on some kind of substance and just kind of thought they could run out in between moving cars. Um, and there are some encampments right there next to 87. Um, and unfortunately, there's, there's an impact um, to that that I'm not sure painting a bike lane is gonna fix. And so how are we working with not only the city's um, homeless outreach team, but also the county in, in having these conversations about homeless encampments and just the safety of residents. And I'll tell you, this has come up with 
uh, 101 and Story Road. We have, my office it talks a lot to Caltrans. We've had to do some abatements at Story and 101 because people are running out into the freeway and it's not safe. And so how are we having these discussions about the safety of encampments right next to 87 um, and Kurtner, you know, in that area. It's very unsafe. And what are we doing? I'll, I'll begin the answer to this. And if other people on the team want to jump in, they're welcome to. Um, first is the location that you mentioned, which is Monterey and um, Tully slash Kurtner, because it changes name there. Um, there have been two pedestrian fatalities in April there. Um, and, um, and so I, we are, you know, tuned into what we can do. There have also been um, some recent fatalities on Kurtner to the west of there. And so we are um, creating that to be one of the site visits for the OTS sponsored, I mentioned it in the slides, but there are eight locations that um, OTS is going to sponsor walk audits and they'll be conducted by our consultant fair and peers. And so that one is in the first group to be done, which we expect to occur in early June. Um, and so the consultant will create some recommendations as part of the scope of work. And we will um, also get all of the input from the community and then refine recommendations. So it's good to know that we'll have the consultant sort of look at it for all the things that they can imagine, plus the things that we can. And our anticipation, or I guess in addition to that, um, it's also in the citywide collision review group of projects. So, um, so we already have that sequence, at least for the main intersection. For the larger Kurtner area project, we're anticipating there to be some quick build and then also um, probably a grant application, uh, which would make it possible to do some of the more expensive things. Um, so that's that's sort of the the sort of large strategy for that area, um, and so we don't know how long the whole thing will take, but um, we're definitely looking into it. In regards to your other question about working with um, homeless encampments, we have reached out to the housing department, but I actually think that this is um, probably a much longer sort of multi prong strategy. Um, possible thing to work with. So while I think the reaching out to the housing department is a start, um, I think you're also aware that we tried to uh, apply for a grant to specifically do outreach to uh, people experiencing homelessness. And last year we were not successful in receiving that. Although I think that that is one of the areas that I am really interested in us working in. And so um, it's another of the things that we could do under our outreach. Um, RFP that begins really shortly. Um, and I, this is the point where if anyone else wants to join me on answering this, if anyone else has additional thoughts, that is fine. Um, but I think that um, as you say, and as I'm thinking, I think it's gonna take a lot more than necessarily just our um, sort of typical things that we do in street redesign to look at some of those, you know, sort of more um, sort of the, the areas around um, the intersection are not all things that are traditionally inside uh, the DOT toolbox. And uh, the type of benefit that we work of working with the Vision Zero Task Force and all of the city and county departments is the ability, ideally, to, you know, to think what we can do across departments. Yeah, and that's really what I'm, I was getting at, right, is, is it requires a multidisciplinary approach. It's, it's much greater than DOT and the tools that DOT has. Um, and, and for example, the county um, is standing up more mobile units, right? And so it, this isn't also just, uh, to Councilmember Perales's point, this also isn't just a city issue. It's, you know, it, these are complex. And, and so um, I just, I think this is an issue that keeps coming up over and over again. And I think it requires us all to think and work a little differently. And that's, that's really the point I'm trying to make. Um, and I know you know that, but I'm just saying that out loud. Um, and, um, and I, I had um, another question about um, AB 550. Um, so I guess this is for Lee. So it's in appropriations now. Um, 
how how do you see so this is you know four years ago or after four years it's coming back um are we coordinating with LA, San Francisco, and Oakland um, on on getting support for this pilot and, and the League of California Cities? Or maybe my colleagues can also answer that who represent the city on that. But I guess how are we coordinating to lobby this? Because I think you know we're also struggling, particularly in San Jose, although everywhere, on enforcement and. Um, enforcement is a key tool, and, and I'm hoping that this can actually get across the finish line, but I guess I'm asking how real is that? Yeah, so I, I would just, uh, if anyone from the policy team in, in DOT has any additional information, but I would say, you know, Benna, um, while she was here, and now Alex, they've been pretty strategic about the other cities that were included on that, given the bill's kind of pathway through the legislature. Um, and so we do have uh, a coalition with those other cities. Um, all of the firms have been meeting and all the IGR staff have been meeting and kind of divvying up responsibility and putting the strategy together on what was included in the bill or not. You know, the big hurdle has been uh, CHP um, and uh, Sheriff's Association at the state level. So there was a lot of upfront work this go around uh, in previous uh, versus previous pieces of legislation to try and drum down the opposition to that bill as it moves through the process. So it is in appropriations now, so that's usually likely to move sometime in May or June through the budget process that the state has. Um, but we can follow up with uh, the members of this committee on any specificity given kind of the status of the bill and any kind of current needs in the, the legislative advocacy process that you might wanna be able to lend your voice to. Thank you, appreciate that. That's it for me, thanks. Thank you, and um, that update would be would be very helpful. We're happy to. I think all of us are happy to mobilize residents, especially. I know we've had a lot of people asking for um, automated enforcement, so I, I've got a, a bunch of folks who are probably willing to write a, write a letter. Um, Councilmember Prolis, your hand is still up. Did you have another comment or question? No, oh, I'm sorry. I'll take it down. That's all right. No problem. <laughs> We, we get uh, coddled, I think, a little bit in our council meetings and we forget in the committee meetings. Um, I have a couple of questions. One is for Lieutenant Anaya. Um, you had made a comment about um, the traffic enforcement working the corridors that have the most problems. Are those, is that information shared from DOT to the traffic enforcement unit? How do you make the determinations about which, which corridors have the most issues? That need no. traffic enforcement. Yeah, no, thank you so much for your question. Um, yeah, so that's it's kind of twofold. We get information from DOT, and uh, I speak with Jesse quite frequently on, on, on the corridors and the primary corridors. And then we also do that through our crime analysis unit at the police department. So the way we do that is we produce a heat map uh, every month. And at the beginning of each month, within the first week of that month, I get the uh, previous month's um, injury accidents and fatality reports. And I disperse that to my team. And then the enforcement sergeants will, will give those to the officers. And then we will deploy based on those, the quote unquote, we call them hotspots in the unit. And uh, that's how we deploy. And so that, that information is, is DOT driven based on the corridors themselves. And then we uh, you know, drill it down one more step with our own internal information from our crime analysis unit. That's great. Thank you. I appreciate that extra detail. Um, regarding a AB 550, is it only for um, automated like speeding tickets or is it for, and I don't know who this question is for, I'm sure Lieutenant Anaya knows, um, or is it also for red light cameras? Is it for both? You know, I'm, not, I'm actually gonna, I might punt this one over to Laura. I am familiar with 8550 and, and the red light camera portion and some of the details as far as it being more of a punitive type thing, uh, not necessarily going on your on your record, but I'm not super familiar with 8550. So okay. maybe or wouldn't, if you wouldn't mind uh, taking the rein on that one. Hi, sure. Um, so um, council member um, Davis, um, good question. Um, AB 550 is to authorize in the state of California, the use of um, speed safety systems for speed enforcement. Um, legislation, California currently authorizes um, the use of automated um, systems for red light violations. 
Oh, so we could use red, we don't use red light cameras though currently in our city, is that correct? Correct, we, we do not. Um, and um, that is something that we have looked at in the past several times. And as Jesse um, reported in his presentation, um, the majority of um, violations associated with, with people who are dying in our city are related to speeding. Um, but yes, we, we can look at um, the use of red light cameras again um, our focus has been on the speed enforcement. Thank you. Jesse, can you, um, is there any, so this, the red light running was the second highest and it, it wasn't insignificant if I remember correctly. Um, are they, are they happening at specific intersections or are they, in, are they dispersed throughout the city? We actually have not done that analysis recently, but I can tell you just looking at that slide again, that of in the last, um five years we've had 244 fatal and severe injuries due to speeding and 84 due to red light running so um, i think if we wanted to run that analysis we could find that out yeah it would be interesting to know um because it's a i, I don't know what the maintenance is on those but it seems like a small uh investment especially if it's happening at, at a very small number of intersections where we could add that automated enforcement um, to ameliorate that issue. So uh, I, I'd appreciate it if, if that's something that, um, that you could bring back to the task force. I think they would, I know they meet quarterly, so it may be um, a little bit quicker to bring it back to the task force. Thank you. Those are all my questions. And I know we have a motion already. I didn't hear any um, desire for any amendments. So I think we're ready for the vote. Foley? Aye. Corrales? Aye. Barza? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Yes, thank you. thank you. All right, we will move on to item number two, the Climate Smart San Jose Plan semi-annual update. Carrie? Is it not, Carrie? Carrie, are you having trouble with your mic? She's not muted, but we can't hear her. Carrie, are you there? Uh, Chair, I'll, I'll send her a text, but Julie, um, if you can get us started. Yeah, you guys can see the presentation? We can, yes. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Julie Benavente, Interim Climate Smart Deputy Director, and also Gary Ramanal is here, Director of ESG and uh, Ramsey Modal from DOT. <clears throat> Today's presentation is our sixth semi-annual update on Climate Smart San Jose, and we're proud to be here to highlight some critical climate work we've maintained during the pandemic. We're reminded on a daily basis that climate change continues, even as the global forest um, focuses on the pandemic and that our mission remains as important as ever. So today we'll give a quick background on Climate Smart, talk about how we're engaging the community during COVID and cover the city's programmatic and policy topics related to Climate Smart. And I'll lastly, touch on the city's latest community-wide greenhouse gas inventory. So I think um, most of you have seen this before, but this is just kind of a little bit of background on um, Climate Smart and how we've structured um, our climate action plan. The plan has three pillars and nine strategies, all with bold goals. And the plan outlines these nine strategies that work towards creating a city that's sustainable and climate smart, connected, and growth focused and equitably inclusive. Um, so now I'll go ahead and talk a little bit about some of our updates. So while progress and strategies are process and strategies have been adjusted to meet COVID restrictions, our community engagement efforts haven't slowed during the pandemic. And I wanted to highlight two of these efforts. Um, since January, our team has 
continue to its co-creation meetings with key community-based organization partners, ICANN and Vigilution to understand community priorities and develop a larger community engagement plan to inform the city's forthcoming building decarbonization roadmap. And this is just one of many examples um, throughout the city, not just in UCD, where um, with these Climate Smart initiatives, we're working directly with these CBOs to build capacity in the community to advance these Climate Smart initiatives. The city has also been part of a larger regionally focused campaign headed by the Building Decarbonization Coalition with a lot of different cities and organizations involved, which is called The Switch Is On. Um, this campaign includes radio, social media posts and ads, and the current influencer sub campaigns to encourage home electrification. For our programs and policies updates, we've organized them under three climate smart pillars um, that I that were shown before. And so under pillar number one, there's been a lot of work that um, San Jose Clean Energy has been doing over the last four months with been brought to council to acquire some of the funding solar into the energy community. In addition, public works staff have been busy implementing LED streetlights throughout San Jose using Measure T funds and are expected to complete that in 2022, followed by park trail um, LED lighting in 2024. Under Climate Smart Pillar number two, um, you may recall we, uh, Council recently approved the Natural Gas Infrastructure Prohibition Ordinance that extended um, coverage to nearly all building types in San Jose, um, and that was passed in December 2020 and goes into effect August 1st, 2021. The planning, building, and code enforcement staff have also continued to work with its consultant and engagement partners, Greenbelt Alliance and SPUR, to develop a model parking and transportation demand management policy with the council study session anticipated in August 2021. I'm now going to pass off to Ramsey to cover some of uh, the additional programs and policies under pillar number two. Um, yeah, Ramses Madhu, uh, Division Manager of Planning Policy and Sustainability for DOT. Um, and um, we are going to start off here with uh, one-way vehicle car sharing. We're actually taking this to council on, um, um, oh, okay, well, uh, okay, one-way car sharing. We're taking this to council on the 18th, um, uh, and we'll get to talk uh, more in depth about that, but that's part of our overall strategy to offer many different ways for people to get around reducing the need to own a car. Next slide, please. Um, as you all know, uh, the big plan um, for transportation is the access and mobility plan. And this is really meant to be uh, the plan that gives council the ability to actually think through what it means to take on these big goals, um, to put in front of us uh, significant reductions in uh, emissions. Um, it means taking very big actions in the transportation space um, and giving uh, 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 the, the committee members and the rest of council a chance to actually kind of see what that means um, is, is our intention here with the Access Mobility Plan, as well as give us the tools to be able to continue to track that over time. So um, as many of you know, uh, we're very, we've been working hard on that. We're excited to bring you a more in-depth presentation on that shortly. Um, next slide, please. So um, we chose to dive really into the electric vehicle charging and assistance area. There's a lot going on um, in the city to help um, accelerate the adoption and use um, of this um, a much greener technology uh, than, than combustion engines. Um, starting out here with the uh, electric vehicle charging network. Um, uh, as you all know, in December 2020, uh, Council approved uh, this program, um, and this is going to add 122 electric vehicle charging ports, uh, ports to uh, various city facilities, including the Happy Hollow Zoo, uh, Police Lot E, Mayberry Yard, and South Service Yard. Um, there's also the Cal EV IP program here, the second bullet point, so $14 million um, that are going to uh, uh, chargers. Um, the program launched in December last year, um, and all funds for this grant opportunity were reserved within hours. Um, at least 25% was allocated for low-income communities, um, and so we're, we're pretty happy to see this continue, um, right? We don't know where those projects will go yet. These were private uh, funders or private applicants coming in, um, but uh, they're currently being reviewed by the Semi Center for Sustainable Energy, um, and we'll find out um, after that. Um, we also have the Drive Forward program here. Actually, no, I've skipped one there. So uh, we secured um, through some very hard work uh, uh, by folks on my team, uh, particularly uh, Emily Breslin um, and, and uh, Graciela Diaz, um, 
um, to move uh, uh, ourselves into the place where we're getting greenhouse gas credits um, for our uh, electric vehicle chargers um, that we run uh, for the city. Um, these credits um, can then be sold um, in the market uh, for these credits um, and gain funds for further electric vehicle work. Um, we're still doing some more work there in getting um, the um, uh, electric charging for those stations set up on EV rates. Um, we have to put in uh, special meters in front of all of the EV rate uh, electric chargers um, to get us uh, to be able to uh, uh, use those rates and that'll lower the cost quite a bit as well uh, for their use. Um, we're also still running the Drive Forward EV Financial Assistance Program. Um, as you probably know, um, we run this uh, in partnership with the Peninsula Family Services Group. Um, and uh, it uh, brings folks in who generally feel like this is a type of uh, uh, car that's not accessible to them. Um, and sometimes it's not the money, um, uh, uh, it's the knowledge um, and just the ability to understand what these things are and how to, to use the financial tools and, and, and rebates and the like to your benefit. And so we're, we're helping folks understand um, how uh, uh, ownership of these vehicles can actually be less over time um, and help deal with upfront capital costs and stuff like that through, um, uh, through financial advising. Um, let's see, we have, okay. And then um, another interesting one is we're working on uh, helping uh, drivers for like Uber and Lyft and, and TNCs move over uh, to electric cars, right? You'll see a lot of Priuses and stuff like that in this, in this market, but not a great deal of electric yet. Um, so we've started working on a, a electrification working group since November last year, identifying areas um, that participants from these uh, companies may find as avenues into it um, and, and building up um, some TNC electric vehicle ambassadors. Um, so drivers um, who can kind of help share the information as to how they've been able to make it work um, uh, with other drivers. Next slide. Um, okay, here we go. Uh, the one-way uh, uh, vehicle sharing, right? So um, we spend a good time on uh, working with neighborhood and advocacy groups, community, uh, community groups to kind of understand how to best structure the one-way vehicle car sharing. Um, it uh, is ready to go uh, for, the, uh, for May. Um, and the initial uh, piece, I think I forgot. Um, I apologize, I'm getting a little hung up here. Um, right, so we'll be bringing these programs or at least the, the, um, the policy uh, to council um, and we are looking at uh, two different groups that will hopefully bring this in. Um, this is Revel, uh, as pictured here as an electric scooter uh, company um, uh, who's already operating in Oakland, San Francisco and other places. Um, and then a, a, a car share company as well. Um, and we're hoping we can incentivize them to be electric, though extra funds may need to be brought in to, to push for that. Um, but we're looking at how to use the fee structure itself to incentivize those EVs. Um, though the folks that have already brought EV cars into this kind of marketplace have actually been given grants to buy those vehicles directly instead of just fee structure changes. Um, and of course, we are going to uh, require uh, discounts for low income folks, um, uh, like we do with most of our other programs like scooters and, and bike share, where we have a very successful program like that. Thank you. Uh, next slide. So under Climate Smart pillar number three, we wanted to highlight two of our um, programs that were completed during this last reporting period. One is, um, well, actually it's not completed, but ongoing, Electrify San Jose is our state pump water heater rebate program. And this program is fully subscribed. Um, it's gonna be running through June 30th, 2021. We've distributed over $228,000 um, of the available rebates to 63 projects. Um, 11 pending on our wait list. Um, this program also has a low income focus and we've met our goal of reaching 20% um, distribution of the rebates to low income customers. Um, during this reporting period, city staff also closed out the Building Performance Leaders Pilot Program. And this was a program that started in November, 2019, ended in December, 2020. We had six participating organizations with 23 buildings representing 3 million square feet. These participants completed energy efficiency projects and also use the city's climate smart challenge platform to as part of their employee engagement campaigns and together they 
achieved a 24% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And finally, just to give you an update on our most recent greenhouse gas, um, com community-wide greenhouse gas inventory, which was for calendar year 2020. It showed San Jose had a 5% reduction from the previous 2020 inventory, and generally we're progressing in alignment with climate smart goals. Um, but our pace will need to continue to um, pick up as in order to meet future goals. So transportation remains the largest contributor um, as with 51% of the greenhouse gas emissions, buildings coming in second to that at 34%. Um, so now we're open to any questions. Thank you. We'll go to the public first. Uh, Prince Dehota is the first speaker. Oh, yes. Uh, um, thank you for um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I don't want to be too long winded. Um, so it's the Bachelor's of Science to Redress the Studies, Stanford Continuing Studies um, program. I just wanted to um, submit a quick comment. So I am researching um, to um, to um, transfer to a new university and become a professor under, under the California Teachers Commission for post-secondary education. Um, I just wanted to um, just share the research um, regarding um, Bloom Energy and the city of San Jose's um, power purchase agreement. So, um, so Bloom Energy produces um, fuel cell um, electricity, gener um, electricity generation and the city of San Jose um, contracted with, with that company. Um, so when I was a judicial intern with Judge Socrates Peter Manukian, I met one of his colleagues who heard a case between Bloom Energy and um, the city of Santa Clara. Um, I met, I believe I met Judge Kuhn when Judge Manukian's um, computer was down. But I, I, as I understand it, that um, is that um, when Bloom Energy um, try to have a CEQA, California Environmental Quality Act, um, 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 inquiry into the company when they want to do business with Santa Clara, um, um, the judge Judge Kuhn found out that um, that the CO two emissions were much um, much higher compared to other sources. I believe of electricity generation. Um, so I just wanted to share this research with you because I you know I I'm researching to um, enter post secondary education in the future. Yeah. So I just thank you for your time and consideration. I just want to leave this on record for, for you all, so. Thank you. Next speaker is the caller with the number ending in 5140. Hello, can everybody hear me? We can hear you. Oh, awesome. I like when you guys can hear me. Sometimes your Zoom doesn't work very well. Oh, what can you do? It's from San Jose. Anyway, red light cameras, huh? That's your that's gonna be your big idea this this week, red light cameras. How come when you guys had red light cameras, they weren't around City Hall or San Jose PD? Remember you guys remember that? Does anybody remember that? The current I'm not supposed to ask. climate smart. Please keep your comments to that climate smart plan. Oh, okay. 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 Well, it's not very smart to have red light cameras. Okay. I, I, I wasn't, I tried to get through to comment on that and I couldn't because of your zoom. So I'm going to choose to comment on it now because I didn't get a chance to comment on it before. You can comment so, on that at open forum. This is for the climate smart update. Okay. You know, what's not smart about the climate is trying to control it. Like Bill Gates is, or like your city council is like not having gas stoves. Is that how you guys are going to control the climate with not having gas stoves and uh, natural gas to heat your home with? That's not – is that the zero carbon that you're looking for? Not very smart. Okay, that's not – you know what else isn't smart? City council. Not very smart. And, uh, yeah, I, I want to say that I'm pro uh, flush toilet tanks with two gallons, uh, the old light bulbs we used to have, gas stoves, gas heat. That's what I'm pro about. And you guys down there would make it so you have to live by candlelight. Okay? You guys shouldn't be dictating what the environment is going to be at all. Because look at how you guys waste money, time, energy, everything else. You guys want us to live in third world conditions. I'm wondering when you're going to bring by the gruel buckets for us to eat. 
everybody on that city council right now, the way you're voting, you should all be ashamed. Thank you. Next speaker is Susan Butler Graham. Hi. Um, good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Susan Butler Graham, volunteer coordinator of Mothers Out Front Silicon Valley. We thank all the departments involved for preparing the semi-annual debate uh, update on San Jose Climate Smart Plan. It's great to see the ongoing efforts to make San Jose a more sustainable, safe, and healthy city, and we're proud to support this process. Special thanks to Yal Kissel and team for all the work on the 2019 greenhouse gas inventory. While we're happy to see that the city's made great progress on reducing greenhouse gases from electricity due to San Jose clean energy, and some progress on reducing greenhouse gases from transportation, we're very concerned that greenhouse gases from buildings actually rose from 2017 to 2019. Greenhouse gas emissions due to the use of natural fossil gas in buildings rose by an alarming 6%. Some of this increase could be from the use of on-site electricity generation by data centers and other facilities using distributed energy resources, DERs, such as fuel cells powered by fracked gas. Unfortunately, the inventory data does not include all of the greenhouse gases caused by on-site electricity generation. We really need to accurately track all of the sources of greenhouse gases in San Jose. Please direct ESD staff to conduct a thorough analysis of the greenhouse gas emissions from on-site generation of electricity, incorporating the data from eGrid to fill in this gap. Please also direct planning staff to carefully track each of the exemptions they granted to the updated gas ban in December, including the number of new facilities proposing to use DERs, such as fuel cells. The city and the public need to know how many exemptions are being granted, how many megawatts of electricity of energy they're using and the amount of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions they're releasing. If there's more funding needed, please allocate it. Thank you. Thank you. Last speaker is Blair. Hi, uh, thank you so much for the words from the previous speaker and uh, also for the first speaker today. Uh, thanks for his words as well. Um, boy, you know, my own shallow knowledge of these subjects. I hope I can help uh, with what was just said. You know, how are we going to deal with the future of fuel, fuel cell, hydrogen fuel cell technology and bloom energy? What, what, is the, what are those questions? Um, can hydrogen fuel cells actually use renewable energy instead of having to use natural gas? That 6% number of, you know, natural gas use is, is surprising. Uh, why aren't we doing better with that? Um, you know, I understand that the hydrogen fuel cell use could be in use as emergency backup generator use uh, in preparing for an upcoming really large earthquake that I've talked about many times now that may possibly be here by the year 2023. And I, I still think that if that is the case, and that's what we're preparing for, we can still prepare with our good renewable ideas and really work towards those good efforts. For instance, uh, San Jose has just recently, they, they're developing good, really good subsidy programs for local community energy, uh, which is following the examples of East Bay community energy. But at the same time, San Jose is still using, you know, about 50% of dirty fossil fuel use in their community energy plan. That's ridiculous, you know, with these subsidy plans going full swing now as East Bay Community Energy, why not make the efforts as East Bay Community Energy to work towards 100% renewable energy ideas? Um, and that's how we address the future of, of natural disasters and get out of natural disasters sooner. And we don't have to rely on dirty fossil fuels. Thanks. Thank you. Next speaker is Wyan Trump. Hi, um, I'm with, uh, I am Wyan Trung on the leadership team of Mothers Out Front. There is a 30 year lag between the time that greenhouse gases are emitted and when the effects are felt. Heat will continue to rise, which will, could very well trigger what is called multi breadbasket failure, as if pandemic related insecurity were not, uh, insecurity were not enough, 
Global food supplies will likely go into major crisis due to the climate, even here in California. Fracked gas is mostly methane, which is up to 84 times more potent at greenhouse gas than CO2. The city of San Jose will not meet its climate smart goals due to the gas ban exemption grants of distributed energy resources, uh, such as sold by Bloom Energy. I strongly support the request made by uh, Susan Butler Graham and Mothers Out Front and the letter we sent in. The DER resumption un unfortunately opens the door to power generation much dirtier than even gas powered fuel cells. Do not increase the burden our children already have to pay. If additional funding is needed, needed to do this tracking, please allocate it in the upcoming budget. Thank you for your service during this, these difficult times. Thank you. We'll return to the committee. Council Member Cohen. Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to thank the uh, staff for this important work. Um, one of the most important things that we're doing is focusing on reducing our, our greenhouse gas emissions and getting down to carbon neutrality over, um, you know, over the next, hopefully fewer than 10 years, but when we can get there. Um, and I know we're doing a great job in terms of um, promoting access to electric vehicles in the transportation sector. The, the data that, and I wanted to thank uh, Susan from Others Out Front for, for pointing at that data that shows our building, the, the um, emissions from buildings still being significantly high. Um, so I hope that we can think about ways to help our um, building owners, building residents in buildings um, to retrofit and upgrade their buildings. Um, I'm, you know, it's great that we're not gonna have natural gas in new buildings, but we have a lot of existing buildings that are getting old and don't have the best um, energy efficiencies um, built into them. And so there is a lot of room for us to, to upgrade those, um, you know, those buildings to try to make a, make a dent. And even a, even a five, 10% improvement in each of these buildings can make a huge difference in our emissions. It also is obviously good for the folks who are paying to uh, heat their buildings and that they save, save money in addition to um, the, the benefits that we get in the climate. So I, as you know, I, I had introduced the building retrofit as a priority for the city back in the priority setting, but it is something that I think we should keep our, our um, focus on a little bit is how we can help and assist, assist residents, give them incentives, just like we incentivize changing of appliances, which we should continue to do. We should also incentivize the upgrade of, um, of our building infrastructure to try to improve the efficiency of those buildings. Uh, I will move to accept the report. Second. Second. Thank you. Do any of my colleagues have, other colleagues have comments? Questions? I have one question for Ramses. Uh, it sounded like we don't, we have a, an electric scooter provider um, kind of ready to come in. Is there a timeline on that? Um, we'll see what their their business situation is uh, post you know the the, um, uh, the 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 passage of the policy and and what's going on right they're 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 interested they're signaling they want to um, and and they're definitely still doing the work with us to kind of figure out how to land um, but they they you know I think reasonably said we're 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 still tentative based on on kind of how um, the recovery happens. Okay, and then it sounded like we didn't have a car sharing or a the one way car sharing EVs kind of identify a company identified yet or a we, direction on that. We we do, um, but they're even more tentative than the scooters. Um, so gotcha. they're, they're they're in discussion, and the one that is there um, again is is on the fence about whether they'd be able to bring EVs in or not. Though okay. we, we would argue that that's secondary to getting the program in. Uh, Laura Sichinski is on the line here. If, if you want to add anything to that, Laura. The, the car share company that's expressed interest is uh, AAA's gig car sharing that's in the East Bay, as well as um, San Francisco and Seattle. Thank you. Um, appreciate that. Those, that's all for my questions. If my colleagues don't have anything we are ready for the vote. Looks like we're ready. Foley? Aye. 
Perales? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Cohen? Aye. And Davis? Yes, thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to item three, discharge regulations and future impacts on the San Jose Santa Clara Regional Wastewater Facility report. Jennifer Brown. You can see the presentation, I can't hear you. Uh, you're done me, Jay. There you go. Uh, Council members, this is uh, Carrie, I'll go ahead and get started. And then, um, you know, as you heard at the Valley Water Regional, uh, Valley Water uh, City of San Jose Council meeting, there's a lot going on in the Bay and the regulations are continuing to change. And we, you know, when you look at this uh, picture of the regional wastewater facility, it really does kind of indicate what a big endeavor this is. So all of the waste from the, you know, most of the South Bay comes to this facility uh, 24 hours a day. And so the team does a great job of monitoring and measuring what was happening today. But at the same time, we need to go, we are going out into the bay and sampling and finding out what we see is happening in the future and then looking for signals from the state and federal regulatory agencies to help understand what uh, regulations are coming down, down the way for us because those regulations will also require us to do um, ongoing upgrades. So, um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Jennifer and just wanted to share with you how, um, how tricky this can be. But, um, but important to, uh, to the work to preserve the environment that we do as an organization. So uh, Jennifer is our uh, division manager leading um, sustainability and compliance for the uh, utilities that ESD operates. Thank you, Carrie. Um, good afternoon, Chair Davis and members of the committee. We're pleased to present to you our annual report to this committee. Um, and during which we'll be discussing the major regulations that may affect the facility and the activities that we're engaging in that not only offer compliance, but ultimately the enhancement of the environment and the habitats through our stewardship of them. Um, I'm also going to be introducing today Eric Dunlavy, who is our Environmental Services Program Manager over wastewater compliance, and then we will also um, have Jason Nettleton, who's our senior engineer over air compliance at the wastewater facility as well. Let's see how to advance this slide. How is that supposed to advance? Sorry, I don't know why this won't go. Jennifer, maybe um, we could yeah. just um, kind of run through without the slides while we uh, while we figure well, it out. Yeah, um, I might need Eric to share his screen instead because <laughs> now it's just not advancing. You might want to stop sharing and try again. Sometimes that sometimes that helps. Okay. Share again. Jennifer, thank you for your patience trying to uh, figure it out. It's hard enough to do with one person watching, let alone uh, a bunch of council members. Right. Um, okay, let's try this one. Slide show. I'm so sorry. <laughs> there we go. Thank you for that tip. Okay, so pictured on the screen, you'll find the location of the regional wastewater facility near the black arrow within our service area. And you can see that that covers, the service area covers about half of Santa Clara County. We are the largest advanced wastewater facility on the West Coast, and it serves about 1.5 million people and 17,000 uh, businesses. Our stellar operations and maintenance staff keep this facility operating consistently 24 seven with no days off, including during the pandemic. We kept everything going um, without issue. The facility is subject to many regulations and holds multiple permits. And therefore we're mindful to track any upcoming legislation or regulations that could impact our operations. 
As such, we're actively involved in regional coalitions for shared programs, including studies and information exchanges. And we also maintain collaborative relationships with our regulators, which has greatly benefited the regional wastewater facility. Pictured on this screen is where the facility's discharge channel, Artesian Slough, flows into Lower Coyote Creek. Also got that in my background here. There are several permits that we must comply with and a variety of issues we participate in to protect the receiving waters in the bay. However, there are some issues that could have a greater impact and, and therefore take a little bit longer to prepare for. So we've listed some of the key regulatory areas that we're monitoring and we'll be discussing more in, in detail later. For now, I'll pass along this presentation to Eric Dunleavy to go over those permits and regulations for wastewater compliance. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, so there are three key wastewater permits that apply to the RWF that are issued by the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Quality Control Board under authority of the State Water Board and US EPA. And those permits are the RWF individual permit, the nutrient watershed permit, and the mercury and PCBs watershed permit. The two watershed permits are group permits that apply to all 37 wastewater treatment plants discharging to San Francisco Bay. And our current individual permit for the facility was reissued in February 2020. And the most significant change is that the facility must use a new species for toxicity testing in our final effluent. Uh, next slide, please. So the focus of the nutrient watershed permit is on nitrogen and phosphorus, and those are two elements that occur in all wastewater and are essential to a healthy bay, but they can have detrimental effects on some water bodies if they occur at high levels. The nutrient permit requires effluent monitoring and financial support of a bay science program to understand the effects of nutrients on the bay's ecology. To date, the scientific study of the bay has not identified clear ecological impairment of the bay due to nutrients, and this is despite very elevated levels in bay waters. And to our credit, the RWF is already very effective at removing nutrients from the wastewater due to past upgrades and our very reliable O&M staff. Wastewater compliance staff have also proactively undertaken scientific investigations of the environmental condition in Lower South Bay as shown in these pictures. And it looks pretty good out there. Uh, the permit also requires a regional evaluation of the opportunities and costs to reduce nutrient loads to the bay through expanded recycled water and through utilizing nature-based solutions such as treatment wetlands or horizontal levee discharges that beneficially reuse treated wastewater. These evaluations of cost and opportunity will add useful information to our understanding of the costs of engineered treatment technologies that have traditionally been used to reduce nutrients in wastewater. Costs for traditional treatment through facility upgrades are estimated to be in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And at present, nutrient regulations in the form of a nitrogen load cap that will consider short-term population growth will be imposed on the RWF in 2024 with an expected compliance date of 2029. The Capital Improvement Program does have projects already scheduled that will further reduce our nutrients in the, in the effluent by improving the reliability of our treatment processes. These projects will provide incremental improvements, but will not meet the long-term load cap requirements. So to ensure we can meet the load cap, the RWF conducted a process optimization study in 2020 that evaluated the upgrades necessary to meet this load cap by 2029. The technology has been identified and the timing and implementation are currently being determined. Next slide, please. So there are currently no regulatory limits for constituents of emerging concern or CECs. However, by their nature, CECs are pollutants that should be evaluated very carefully in wastewater and in the bay in order to determine if pollution reduction strategies or regulations to control them are necessary. For CECs, we've taken a proactive approach in assessing environmental risk, and then we take action to reduce that risk through targeted pollution prevention outreach as appropriate. We accomplish this through a collaborative science-based process through the San Francisco Bay Regional Monitoring Program, where we work with nationally recognized science advisors, regulators, and stakeholders. The program evaluates current knowledge and product use patterns to prioritize CECs for study, and then develops a monitoring and assessment strategy that in turn informs pollution prevention priorities and messaging. ESD's outreach messaging about flea and tick treatments for pets and our safe medicine disposal campaign are both great examples of how collaborative scientific evaluations have 
helped focus public outreach messaging campaigns. And this approach helps avoid future regulations and expensive treatment systems upgrades that would be necessary to fix a problem that could have been avoided. And a CEC that has the attention of the scientific community and regulators is PFAS. These are perfluorinated chemicals that are used in a number of products from food packaging to firefighting foams. Our regulators are currently requiring data collection on the amount of PFAS that is being released into the environment. And because of our proactive approach to CECs, PFAS discharge data has already been collected for the RWF well in advance of these requirements. The PFAS concentrations in RWF effluent do not indicate we are a major source of the contaminant, but it's, it is still present in our effluent. Next slide, please. And the last topic on water regulations is toxicity testing. Since 1994, the facility has tested its final effluent for toxicity with the majority of this testing being conducted by our own dedicated ESD lab staff. Up until March, 2020, the same species, the water flea was used for this testing. Through focused studies and careful negotiations with our regulators, in April, 2020, we successfully changed our test species from the water flea to the fathead minnow fish. This change in test species is advantageous to the facility because the previous species is prone to periodic false positive results that erroneously indicate low level toxicity. The new species does not have this problem. Past consequences of the false positive errors uh, with the water flea resulted in additional studies and evaluations into the erroneous results, but there were no regulatory consequences or penalties. However, a newly approved statewide toxicity policy will impose regulatory penalties in the future should even low level toxicity be identified. So our proactive approach in getting our species changed is advantageous to the facility, not just in terms of reducing the number of follow-up investigations, but it provides protection from unwarranted regulatory penalties. Next slide, please. And shifting gears to our biosolids processing and programs, the RWF generates approximately 85 tons of biosolids per day, which must be disposed of or beneficially reused. RWF biosolids are currently trucked once annually to nearby Newbie Island landfill, and they're beneficially applied as alternate daily cover or ADC to cover landfill waste. The SB 1383 legislation passed in 2016 targets reductions in short-lived climate pollutants by limiting the organics that can be sent to landfills. The legislation has introduced uncertainty for wastewater agencies because biosolids are included within the definition of organics to be diverted from landfills. This may limit the long-term viability of disposition of biosolids as ADC. Although the RWF is planning to transition out of its current drying process to a mechanized process, the new regulations may not allow adequate time for this transition and could result in an increase in operational costs if the biosolids must be hauled further away while a longer term reuse option is established. And I'll now turn it over to Jason Nettleton for an update on air regulations. Good. Um, the RWF's uh, other major permit is the Title V air permit, which is also described as a federal operating permit. Uh, this permit lists all applicable air quality requirements and requires compliance reporting. The current permit was issued in March 2017 and is up for renewal every five years. Um, we have air permits issued by the Bay Area Air Quality Management District under authority delegated to them by the California Air Resources Board and the Federal Environmental Protection Agency. These permits are intended to limit emissions of criteria air pollutants which contribute to smog, um, greenhouse gas emissions such as methane and and toxic air contaminants, which are chemicals that can have an adverse effect on human health. Uh, RWF is required to apply for air permits prior to constructing any project that could have an effect on air quality. So this requirement applies to most of our capital projects, including the new digesters, the headworks, the dewatering process on the previous slide, and uh, the recently commissioned cogeneration facility. Next slide, please. So one new rule that is expected to affect the RWF this year uh, applies to toxic air contaminants. This rule 1118 will require that the 
facility to pay for a health risk assessment to be conducted by a consultant under the guidance of the Air District. And the health risk assessment is a technical study that's intended to quantify the possible health risks on the surrounding community. And the RWF is in a good position to comply with the new regulation. Um, the new cogeneration facility includes advanced emissions control equipment to reduce emissions of toxic air contaminants. So emissions controls are being installed with the new headworks under construction and under and for the new sledgehammer operations. Uh, in addition, as shown on the slide, the, the RWF does not have any sensitive receptors in the immediate vicinity of operations. So that would expect us to get to get a low any good impact on the surrounding community. Next slide, please. The other area of potential new regulations is greenhouse gases. Um, the first is the cap and trade program, which is one component of the state's greenhouse gas reduction effort. Uh, the RWF was subject to the cap and trade program, but exited the program after five years, 2018, after five years of emissions below the applicability threshold. The second focus of greenhouse gas emission regulations is stage of methane, uh, which is targeted because it's an even more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Uh, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District is developing new regulations to target stage uh, of methane, including one rule, uh, 13.4, that's uh, designed to limit emissions from wastewater treatment facilities. So the development of this rule 13.4 is expected to begin later this year. Um, this new rule could increase compliance costs for the facility, but the impact of the new rule won't be known until it's been drafted. And uh, go to Jennifer for the next slide. Thanks, Jason. So looking ahead on our program's strategy actions, staff is going to continue to monitor and participate in the formal rulemaking process on behalf of the ratepayers in order to advocate for reasonable requirements. Um, an important item that should be noted is that we will ensure that potential regulations and legislation are considered in our discussions with Valley Water on recycled and purified water expansion. We will also continue participating in the strategic applied science and research programs that have informed and shaped regulations and built our in-house technical expertise. It's important to have the science guide us and that we use that to make data-driven decisions. This expertise that we've gained adds to the work with our advocacy and industry stakeholder groups to ensure that regulations are practical and science-based. It gives us that basis to make those um, assertions and, and help that form those regulations. Lastly, we've built in flexibility into our capital improvement program, which allows us to respond to new regulations as they are adopted. Um, Eric touched on this a little bit earlier, but often new and pending wastewater regulations represent advancements in the ability to identify and detect water and air quality contaminants. However, incremental improvements in the overall water and air quality that's mandated by the regulations isn't typically achieved by just incremental investment in the treatment technologies, but often will require larger investments and advanced preparation for those changes. And just so we don't lose track of this important effect, what does our outstanding compliance record and, and proactive um, programs get us besides not in trouble and no violations? It gets us a thriving environment in the South Bay. This area is teeming with fish, birds, and even threatened species like the burrowing owls. Over the, fat, the, the past few years even, bald eagles have successfully bred in Milpitas and they use the areas around the facility for foraging. The threatened longfin long smelt is also thriving in the South Bay compared to other areas in the region where it historically did better. And with that, we're open to discussion and any questions you have for us. Thank you for that presentation. 
I will turn now to the public with a reminder that the topic is discharge regulations and its impact on the regional wastewater facility. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thank you for this item. Thank you for uh, nutrition ideas for our future. Uh, thank you. You know, I, I mentioned in my previous item that, you know, I, I mentioned the year 2023 as how we have to possibly prepare for an upcoming earthquake. Uh, if that can be refuted and talk to myself, uh, I hope I hope you can talk to me about that. But with that in mind, you know, I have been offering that kind of statistic a lot lately. And as a part of uh, uh, what can be ideas of sea level rise and wildfires as natural disaster preparedness things we have to work on uh, for, for the next few years in San Jose, there wasn't mention of sea level rise with this issue. And I think it, it should be noted uh, if that it will be the case uh, at this time for a piece like this, then the nutrition ideas that you're offering are really interesting and hopeful, but it needs to possibly be in context of, you know, sea level rise. I mean, the, the uh, 101 and 880 interchange is continuously being pumped out because water is continuously flooding it now. And I think we have to really prepare ourselves and how we talk about these items in terms of sea level rise and, and, our, and our climate future. And that puts in perspective how we can prepare the future of our society, because you're doing it in science-based terms, and that's exactly what we need and how to prepare our better future. So I hope uh, you can work on doing that. And, um, you know, I, the preparing idea is incredibly important. Uh, you know, uh, I think renewable energy ideas can prepare us much more than reliance on a continual reliance on fossil fuels and can get us out of, uh, you know, if we, there is a major disaster upcoming to, to be prepared with renewables now, to start the process of preparation now can, can let us continue uh, once a major disaster happens. It can, we can continue our- Thank you. Next speaker is caller with the number ending in 5140. Again, the topic is Discharge Regulations and the Regional Wastewater Facility. God, this Zoom is terrible. Anyway, uh, I don't know why it's always hard for me. Everyone else seems to get on these calls but me, but here I am. Anyway, wastewater, you know, can you imagine you guys are like a day late and a dollar short with these kind of things. This should have been done a long time ago, but you guys focus on really stupid things like the bike lanes, like the marches, the, the candlelight vigils, the code enforcement, but you don't seem to care about the water until the last minute. I mean, you guys are living in what you think is a postmodern world and when all of a sudden the regular basics come up, you guys are running around with your hands in the air, don't know what to do. We either have flooding or it's dry. Uh, you, you, you're not managing the water correctly. And quite frankly, nobody ever managed the water correctly except the Native American people who were here first. They knew what to do without heavy machinery, without, without anything, just their, just their sweat on their brow. But you people, you don't know how to do it don't know how to clear the creeks. You don't know how to keep the water clean. You let the good, the good water run out to the ocean thanks to the, the stupid state regulations from, this, from Sacramento and even the federal government. It's insane. The amount of money that we pay in water for water and the taxes and the fees and everything else that goes along with it, we should have the cleanest, coldest, most delicious water coming out of the tap. But instead, you're going to tell us we have to cut back 25% and raise our rates. It's disgraceful. You, you guys are running a student union trying to finish a, a term paper that's late. That's going to get an, and if, you know what? It's, when you guys finally turn in this term paper of all your social experimentation and bad management, you're going to get an F. That's what you're going to get. You know Thank you. Next speaker is Prince Sahota. Prince, when you're ready, please unmute yourself. 
Hello, this is um, Prince Zahoda speaking. I appreciate your um, time. I just wanted to um, ask a question regarding um, um, the regional um, wastewater facility. Is, is the water in that in this facility, is it, um, is it recycled and clean? Does it go uh, undergo like sedimentation, coagulation, filtration? Does it, does it get recycled and re, does, it, does it get recycled and reused by the city of, by the city of San Jose? And that's, that's all, I just wanted to ask that question. Okay, thank you. I'll turn back to my colleagues. Um, Council member Cohen, you are the first speaker, but if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to ask staff to answer the, the caller's question. Council member, yes, the, um, the water is, uh, is treated. Um, and if you're interested in more information and um, you can look on the city's website and we'll run through the process with you. So if you just um, do a search under San Jose Santa Clara Regional Wastewater Facility, uh, there's a couple of videos and some graphics that can walk you through the process. Thanks for that, Carrie. Council member Cohen. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just a, one quick question. Um, I appreciated the comments about the uh, fact that our, our GHG admissions are below a level that we would participate in um, cap and trade. Uh, do you, do we have numbers as to what those levels are and, and how much more work we, more work we think we can do to reduce them further? Um, I'll, I'll hand, uh, Jason, I'll ask you to um, talk about the particulars. Um, Council member, we are also working on uh, a plan to get us to 100% self-powered, so renewable by our own power in the next couple of years. And that'll make uh, that'll make a big difference as well. But Jason, what's the data on that? We have been managing the facility's power mix to stay below the twenty-five thousand metric ton applicability threshold. So that means we burn natural gas up to that threshold, and we can purchase some power from the from the grid. Yeah, and it's not just the the use of power, right? It's the emissions from just as a result of of having um the treatment there the emissions of methane and co2 from from the actual water right that that we're trying to we're, we're sequestering and reusing that i assume so that's that, that's the other part of the question i i know you have a cogeneration facility that's impressive and so how much of that um emissions reduction is due to the fact that we're using those off gases for our cogeneration facility jason yeah, okay, there are a couple of questions there. One is the process emissions are not really included in the 25,000 metric tons. That's mostly attributed to the direct combustion of fossil fuels. And then there's a little bit of pass through methane that wouldn't be combusted. Um, and a little bit of nitrous oxide that's generated in the combustion process. Uh, the second part is we do generate a significant amount of power from the methane collected from our digestion system. That's fed into the new cogen plant that's uh, in my background. Uh, that uh, makes good use of that uh, of that methane. It runs. We have enough biogas to run roughly one of those engines right now. So that's somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, three and a half megawatts worth of power that we're collecting from our digestion system. Okay. And then as we continue down our um, capital improvement program, we are moving to enclose all of our operations. And so that will afford us the opportunity to, um, to reuse some of the off-gassing that's now not included. Right, that's great. Well, thank you. And I thank you for keeping District 4 clean. Thank you, Council Member. I, I wanna thank staff for the report and for the term fugitive methane, which is gonna be, it sounds like a great, <laughs> name for a rock band i don't know um <laughs> it's gonna be stuck in my head for a while i have a question on the the biosolids timeline if you could run through that in a little more detail i did see in the report it's going to come back to to tpac is that coming back to tpac this month in which case you can just give me the real abbreviated version and i'll get it in tpac um so council member we're bringing a full report to um to tpac to talk about the options that we've explored to um to bring it forward, if, if you don't mind, I'd rather wait to, to run it through because it, it's a little deep topic. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. I I'm glad it's coming back. I kind of it kind of perked up my ears that they had finished with those regulations, and I didn't remember hearing that before. So I'm 
looking forward to hearing more about that, which is a strange thing to say about wastewater, I know, but <laughs> it's been an outstanding topic for a while. So I'm glad to hear the regulations are finished. It sounds like it maybe is not the best news for us though, which is unfortunate. So hopefully we can- um, It's good news for the environment. That's good, that's good. <laughs> I, don't, I just don't want to be trucking biosolids because that's not good news for the environment. That's that's the concern. So um, we agree with you on that. Yeah, appreciate it. Um, if no one else has any more questions, Councilmember Cohen, did you have anything more, or would you like to make an, a motion? I'll move to accept the report. Second. Thank you. We are ready for the vote. Foley. Aye. Perales. Yes. Esparza? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Yes. Thank you. That motion carries. And we will move to item four, green stormwater infrastructure implementation update. Matt Kano, take it away. Thank you, um, Chair Davis and council members. Um, Matt Kano, Director of Public Works, and with me today is Matthew Nguyen, our Acting Deputy Director, and Michael Meyer, Senior Engineer in Public Works. Um, and in 2019, uh, Mayor and City Council approved a green stormwater infrastructure plan um, that will um, guide us as we look at reducing the runoff that's going into our creeks and streams and ultimately into the bay um, and treat that runoff before it gets into the water system. Um, and we also passed Measure T in 2018, and we have $25 million in that budget to implement green infrastructure projects. We are moving forward with one already approved by Council at River Oaks and Council District 4. And we're working on a process to determine the next projects that will use the remaining um, roughly 17, 18 million dollars in Measure T for green infrastructure projects. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matthew Nguyen and he's going to um, provide the rest of the today's presentation. Then I'll have a quick closing summary. Thank you. Hi, so I'm Matthew Nguyen with Public Works. Uh, thank you, Matt. And good afternoon, uh, Chair Davis and Council members. Um, so from the uh, GSI plan that uh, staff prepared in 2019, um, we, uh, the, the plan itself identified a total needs of uh, 10, 1068 acre feet of uh, stormwater runoff that the city need to capture and treat. Um, and in order to meet that requirement, by the way, that requirement is coming from the municipal regional stormwater permit and also to meet the uh, by keeper consent decree requirement. So in order to meet that requirement, the city will have to build a series of regional projects as well as LID projects and Green Street projects. Um, taking from that uh, requirement during the last year and a half, staff working on, uh, continue to work on the analysis and we identify a way to, um, to meet that target. And so this is a, a snapshot of what we need to do in order to get to that uh, target of 1068 acre feet. Um, as you see here, it's a combination of uh, LID projects, private de development projects, as well as Green Street and regional projects. And the top three bands that you see on this chart basically represent the total regional projects that the city has to build. Um, the two bands in green are showing regional projects in city owned parkland. And the top band with the hatch line is showing regional project in other land, uh, in, in land that owned by private or other agencies. And we need to get those through partnership or maybe through um, acquiring, I mean, uh, purchasing. So we also look at alternatives to see how else we can reach that target of 1068. Um, and the first column here is showing um, the ideal scenario I just showed recently with a combination of everything. And the next scenario is showing that if we don't build anything in Parkland, um, <clears throat> then the cost will go up but likely we won't be able to achieve this target because there's not enough land in the city to purchase. Um, and then the last two scenarios are showing uh, basically if we solely rely on 
one or another, you know, if uh, scenario three is showing that if we build in parkland only, or if we rely on green street only, then we won't be able to reach the target. And there's one note there that the cost for scenario three is way up there because of the high cost for building green street, um, avoiding utility conflicts and the loss of parking as well as maintenance. Um, so a quick note on Measure T funding, uh, as Matt mentioned, uh, we got the, the funding of $25 million from Measure T to support green, uh, green stormwater program. Um, so far, we allocate roughly about $10 million for the River Oaks regional project with anticipation of receiving about $3.2 million from grant. Uh, this project is gonna be in construction next year and it will take about a year to complete. Um, Michael will talk a little bit more about the detail of this project. But uh, anyway, we still have about $17 million left in Measure T that we can use toward future near-term projects. Um, so with that, we continue with our analysis and we were able to identify a few near-term projects. Um, as showing, uh, we, we show it on this list. The first one is CD land south of Phelan. This is also known as the horse table. And this was recommended in the original, um, in the GSI plan. So um, it's still there. Another site is the Sycamore Terrace, which is on Coleman and Armadan Expressway. Um, Hellier Avenue property, actually this belonged to the county but the city of San Jose has the right to build a detention basin there, which we can talk to uh, the county and convert it, eventually convert to the bio retention as needed. Uh, Kelly Park gravel parking lot is the lot uh, near Kelly Park and it's right now serving the San Jose historical garden, um, but we can build something underground at that location. Um, and lastly, uh, a few projects uh, belong to other agencies and we still need to coordinate with them to, uh, if, if we need to uh, go to their site. So on top of that, we also come up with a few uh, near-term green street projects. Uh, the first two actually are already, well, the West San Carlos is, is already funded by uh, Caltrans and um, it's mentioned in the Vision Zero report earlier. Story Keys is another project that we're looking at. Um, we may need to um, invest some funding to support the green street component of this. Uh, Monterey Road, this is a very long and large project. It will cost up to 144 million. But during the analysis, we identify one segment around Emberger and Lewis. Um, that we can, you know, um, build some green street components in there. Um, it costs about $7 million estimate. And um, with that, I'm in the next few slides, uh, Michael will walk through the conceptual design for some of our projects. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Uh, good, be good afternoon, uh, Chair and all council members on the committee. Uh, my name is Michael Mai. I'm the senior engineer with the Public Works uh, Department. Uh, Matthew, can you go back to the River Oaks site? Okay. So the, uh, the River Oaks project is one of the first uh, publicly funded project uh, by the city. The, uh, the project is located in North San Jose, uh, adjacent to the Riverview Park near First Street and River Oaks Parkway. The, the project will capture and treat uh, stormwater at the existing detention basins prior to discharging into Guadalupe River. Uh, it is intended to provide a functional multi-benefit GSI project that improve uh, stormwater quality, maintains flood control benefits, and also adding public access to educational, recreational, and aesthetic amenities in addition to enhancing the nearby habitat. So during the preparation of the planning survey report for the project, we solicited inputs from the public 
and for the project stakeholders. And uh, we come up with a preferred alternative uh, and then proceeded with the uh, CEQA uh, preparation. So the city council approved the project plan of study report and, the, and CEQA documentation uh, in March. So in addition to uh, a main feature of the uh, uh, storm weather treatment, uh, we also included all the prep features, such as a walking trail around the basin, uh, composed of uh, permeable pavement, a board walk with the rear end platform over the detention basins, two deck overlooks with seating, exercise equipment, signage, and a demonstration bio retention planter. And the, the last component is the public art. And uh, we have been working with the Office of the Culture Affair to uh, include the art component into this project. Uh, next slide. So uh, when we move forward with uh, all the projects that Matthew mentioned about, I know that we still need to go to the feasibility study. Uh, so we talk about the uh, Kelly Park horse stables, the Hellier property, and the Sycamore Terrace. So if the project are found to be feasible, uh, the project would be planned, designed, and constructed to include the similar components uh, as the river site. Now, in addition to, uh, uh, to those components, we also include the public with all the consideration to, to in, into building these projects. They include the public health and safety, a robust o and program, uh, we want to make sure that the projects are compatible with the current park uses. Uh, the goal is to enhance the site, not to take away the benefits. And also, uh, one of the other considerations is we allow the flexibility in the design as appropriate to adapt to future uses. So uh, for the for the Kelly Park House Stable, this project is located in the uh, uh, council uh, District 7, uh, with a project footprint of about 3.2 acres. The total lands for this, for this loss about 13 acres. So we only talk about a quarter of the size here. The project is bounded by, uh, on three sides, by county, a creek, uh, flowing from south to north. Uh, we want to transform uh, the low line area into a centralized stormwater system that filters and infiltrate runoff from an estimated of 613 acres drainage area. Um, and uh, the, the project components will include the uh, settlement basin, bioretention cells, infiltration basins, and all the similar components uh, that we are designing for the revolves. And uh, I'm talking about the uh, park uh, features like uh, educational, aesthetic, and recreational. The uh, next slide. Uh, this is another location uh, located near Albany Valley. Uh, we have been uh, talking to the Open Space Authority and uh, they go along with this project concept and uh, we plan, we like to go ahead with the feasibility for the site. And similarly to uh, the River Oaks, the, pro the project components would include the bioretention uh, and all the park features. The key thing is we want to protect the sitting, um, sycamore trees and also maintain the meadow-like character uh, for this location. Next slide. Another location that Matthew mentioned about is the Hellier property. Uh, the city used to own a lot of lands along uh, its location and then we transfer the property to the county, but we also maintain a perpetual uh, right of way to build and operate a flood detention basin. So in lieu of flood retention basin, we like to convert it into a, a GSI green infrastructure project that would treat uh, some water, but also including all the uh, components uh, similar to the revolves. Next slide. And uh, another location that we talk about is the uh, Kelly Park uh, gravel parking lot. Uh, we, we like to build an underground uh, GSI project. So we, we maintain the existing parking lot uh, above and also maintain all the trees, restore the site to the original condition. Uh, the, the purpose of this uh, uh, underground structure is also to treat and, treat and filter some water. 
and maintain the uh, the existing uses of the of the parking lot. Next slide. And uh, the one of one of the uh, other components of the GSA project is to uh, build a uh, green streets projects. Now, uh, the, the purpose of the green streets is all similar to the original project is to reduce water pollution and improve uh, some drainage. Uh, the major components for the screen streets include the uh, bioretention basins, rain gardens, permeable pavement, planter boxes, and urban tree canopy as appropriate. And uh, we would like to incorporate and inter inter integrate the screen street project with all the uh, city's plans, such as the uh, San Jose Complete Streets Design and San Jose Better Bike Plan, and all the city transportation projects, including street uh, rehab and redesign bicycle and pedestrian improvement. Now, all the benefits for this uh, Green City project is to increase the appeal for bikes and pedestrians, improve bike and pedestrian safety, and vehicle traffic calming, and also to, to reduce the urban heat island effect. And now I'd like to turn back to Mark for closing. Thank you, Michael Matthew. Um, just briefly, um, you know, this is the new way of doing business in the city. The green stormer, the infrastructure is here to stay um, and um, to make sure that we have clean water um, uh, moving forward and our storm water is, um, storm runoff is treated before it goes into our creeks and waterways. Um, we're, this is a recommendation that we're actually making to the mayor and city council as part of our upcoming measure T report. And so we're just sharing this recommendation in our T&E memo and with you today. We, are, we do want to move forward immediately with the Story Keys funding because that is a project that is underway and needs a little bit of funding um, to put a green, green infrastructure um, component to it. Um, we have some more work to do on Sycamore Terrace and the other uh, regional potential sites to um, make sure um, we are recommending the appropriate project to the Mayor and City Council with that Measure T funding. So we're going to do a detailed feasibility study of, those, of that site as well as the Monterey Road um, on Umbarger site. And then we'll continue to look for opportunities um, to advance additional reg uh, regional and green infrastructure projects. But again, we'll have um, some recommendations on these next steps um, in our June memo on Measure T to the Mayor and City Council. Thank you. And we're here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. We'll go to the public first. Um, first speaker is Blair Beekman. Hi. Boy Weekman here. Uh, thanks for this item. Um, it was nicely presented. Uh, you nicely showed that you're going to be working on uh, city government projects, projects that will relate to city government uh, land a lot of the time. And it sounds like you're just kind of, you know, practicing and getting the feel for for how this can work. And thank you. And you have a few other projects like along Monterey Road. Monterey, Monterey Highway, that seems like kind of a, a, an initial early start to experiment and see how this project works. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, what I'm worried about is in a few years from now, and, um, you know, for as good as this project can be, there can be gentrification implications about this project. I don't know exactly where, but I think they should be noted at this time so we can prepare for them. And, you know, for as much as this project can help things, I think we have to be sensitive to communities on the east side and, um, boy, I just how it, how this can actually work and, and fit in with the uh, surrounding environment well. And, uh, you know, it's not a one size fits all thing. And so good luck in how you can work on this. And, uh, and just, I hope every, everyone can be involved. I think if everyone's involved and, and offers input to it, uh, you know, good solutions can develop and, and uh, I think can please all sides. It's just a matter that make sure to communicate with, with all sides of, of local neighborhoods uh, in the future of these sort of projects. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Next speaker, speaker is Joshua Quigley. Uh, thank you. This is Josh Quigley again from Save the Bay. Uh, just wanted to thank the staff in particular for all the time and effort that's gone into this report um, during a very challenging time. And also um, in particular to Michael and Matthew for listening to, for, uh, listening to our feedback um, 
this green stormwater plan is the foundation of the larger urban greening effort that we've advocated for over the past year and which a majority of the council voted to endorse during the roadmap process in March. And the project list offered today is the first chance to really make progress on that effort. Um, and so I encourage you to ensure that this plan is being carried forward with the council's interest in advancing the integrated urban greening strategy in mind. Overall, the plan is presented as clear eyed about the scope of the challenge and the cost to ensure that San Jose meets its water quality obligations under the Federal Clean Water Act. These steps are crucial to restoring city waterways and protecting the health of the Bay for future generations. And as I previously mentioned, the larger urban greening effort seeks to align a variety of plans, including this green stormwater plan and Vision Zero, among others, to ensure that the city is undertaking a comprehensive greening initiative to protect water quality, enhance climate resilience, and improve pedestrian and bike safety and the quality of life for San Jose residents. So to that end, I'm glad to see that staff are recommending advancing some initial green streets, uh, green and complete streets projects alongside the important regional projects. Um, but we're realistic that these are limited and pilot projects essentially. Uh, for example, it's unfortunate that the Story Keys project doesn't connect all the way with the quick build safety improvements planned for Story Road. Uh, because that leaves a gap uh, of, uh, between areas of enhancement for pedestrian safety. Um, we also want to make sure that this is being evaluated with the broader climate resilience perspective uh, in alignment with city planning priorities. So we're supportive of the approach, but we hope it's the first step in, in the city continuing the longer term work to expand this into an integrated vision for the city. Thank you. Turning back to my colleagues, Councilmember Esparza. Thank you, um, I was having some tech issues. Um, so I have a few questions. Um, one of the issues raised at the Parks Commission was um, site selection criteria, because uh, when this came up in 2019, there were a lot of discussions and questions and frankly, a lot of confusion in the public about what these projects were. And um, there was a, so when this, came up before the Parks Commission recently, there was a discussion around previous site selection, um, including bonuses for parks and inclusion in low income areas, um, trying to take a, an equity approach. Um, and my understanding is that is not um, part of the current criteria. Can you explain? Yes, um, and then Matthew can add, um, correct anything and you'd like to Matthew, but um, so, Equity is a, we, we, we had uh, some a good discussions on equity related to this project. And I've actually heard it from both kind of sides of the equity um, on this is on one hand, if we put projects in, um, in areas that need it more than others um, from a, let's say from an economic or equity standpoint, um, it makes sure that those areas, creeks get cleaner um, sooner and waterways get cleaner sooner. However, we've also heard on the flip side that um, these um, there's a perception that these don't enhance neighborhoods um, and we're working through that perception right now but there's a perception that these don't enhance neighborhoods because when you build the regional projects um, they are we, we're working on building them so that they're really nice areas to walk around and maybe even have viewing platforms but they're not necessarily um, areas that people can go um, to the bottom of the basin and play soccer in and things like that so we've actually kind of heard kind of so that so have it so to answer your question we did not, um, although we had a lot of discussions about equity as a team in this, we didn't include equity as a criteria in what we're, um, it was part of the process because in our discussions, but it wasn't part of the criteria for what we have in, for, in front of you today. What we took a look at really is what are those projects that are just the most implementable in the near term? And our list was pretty short um, because the implementable projects are projects that the city either owns or has site control of and that that we feel won't then be impacting, let's say an active park space. We eventually wanna put projects under, maybe under ball fields and things like that, but that would be really expensive and it would have a uh, significant short-term impact on that open space. And so again, sorry, a little long-winded, but we didn't necessarily, equity was part of the discussion, but it wasn't a formal criteria that we used to present the project list in front of you today. And I, sorry, I don't know if I fully answered your question, but. A little bit, uh, Matthew, did you have, Anything to add before I? Yeah, if I remember correctly, uh, there was a discussion about um, 
giving extra credit to to the site selection when it's in the uh, disadvantaged neighborhood back then. Uh, we came back and talked to ESD. Uh, and yeah, it was a criteria that was used by Scovert, which is the county's uh, level when they review the entire uh, process for the entire Bay Area. And when uh, we took it back to, um, to the city level, we didn't include that criteria. So back then it wasn't part of, of the criteria to select those six locations. Um, and yes, during this time of the um, analysis, when we add more site to the database, we definitely didn't use any of that criteria in our analysis. So it's not on that uh, criteria list. We look at yeah. more alerts, yeah. Oh, thank you, and I think I think that's that's really the the heart of my comment, which is I think um, I'm I'm not opposed to it. Uh, actually, initially in 2019, there was so much confusion. I had a lot of community meetings around this because because people were freaked out, and once they understood what it is, you know, it was fine. But um, but it's also an opportunity to use tax dollars to 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 benefit the environment, to benefit our water supply, to benefit um, the community, but it's also an opportunity to, to add another benefit, which is to uplift a community that needs it. And I, and I bring this up because in District 7, where we have a creek, right? I'm not the only one that has a creek for sure, but there's a creek and, and there's a lot of poverty um, around those areas and a lot of need. Um, and, and not a huge amount of amenities that are free um, to the public um, that lives there. And so um, that was actually one of the things that attracted me to this project, to this whole a concept, was that it's, it's an opportunity to uplift, to add some type of amenity to a community that needs it, um, that may not be able to afford disc golf or may not be able to afford to go to Happy Hollow, but um, would use the park or things like that. And, um, and, uh, I, and it's also another reason why I'm super excited about the Monterey Road um, opportunity. And that area in particular is um, uh, an area that, that could use that. Um, I had another question around maintenance. Um, uh, so how, how, who would have what responsibility for ongoing maintenance? Sure. Um it depends on the project, um, and there's three departments primarily that will be involved. It'd be transportation, parks and rec, and public works. Um, and if it was, um, let's say, if it was on a regional park, uh, if it was on a park site, um, it'd probably be a combination of transportation department and parks and rec. Um, if we're doing an underground storage with a lot of mechanical equipment, public works would be involved because that's a lot of the things that are we do on a regular basis. And so um, if it was on a green street, primi likely primarily transportation department. And so with every new, we consider these like standard new capital projects, such as new fire stations, new, new parks, et cetera. So as part of the annual budget process into the budget forecast, we estimate the funding that is required for these new amenities. And we put that into the city's forecast. And so that to the appropriate departments and that money will get added to the appropriate departments as part of a future budget cycle. That's what we're doing right now for River Oaks as an example. Okay, all right, and with that, um, I'll move to accept uh, the status report. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Cohen. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for the report and uh, the, the, the good work identifying sites. I'm excited to see what the, the first project River Oaks ends up looking like. Um, I wanted to ask about a couple of things. First about parks. You, you talked about putting, for example, uh, under ball fields and in, in parks. I assume it's much more expensive and difficult for us when we're doing it at a place that already has a park versus kind of building it into a new park as it's being designed and built. Are we, I, is the city identifying locations where new parks are coming in to try to build some of these features into those new parks as they're designed? That's a, a great question. And yes, you're, you're, you're spot on. It's a lot easier to build it as the park's being built. Um, we haven't identified any um, any 
new opportunities yet um, for um, what you're saying for new parks, but we have had that as part of the discussions. Um, and it's a great point um, that we haven't talked in detail lately about the parks and rec with the parks and rec department with, although we have in the past. And so we will take that back. It's good feedback. At the risk of being uh, um, presumptuous, I will make some suggestions because in district four, we have two large parks that have large master plans in place that have yet to be built out. Um, and and Alviso Park, which has a major drainage issue as it is, um, they're talking about moving and relocating a couple of ball, a one ball field and building a second brand new ball field if that park can get built. I mean, it, there's, a, there's a funding shortfall right now, but it, uh, to me, that's a great opportunity for a place where, you know, that if that master plan were pursued, we'd want to do some drainage anyway because of the geography there. And it might be a great place to do a project like this. And then I would also suggest, obviously, you're fully aware of the Agnew site. It's a large park site that has a lot of opportunity. Um, and that, you know, we hope that'll get built sometime in the next few years. Um, and, and so I would hope that we would consider that location as well for something like this. Yes, we'll definitely take that back. Yeah. And, and then um, when we build smaller parks, you know, some of these features don't necessarily lend themselves to, I mean, they could be underneath play, playgrounds and, or things, but they also could be kind of just smaller parts of the park that are in the perimeter around where the trails are or something. Is that something you would do is, is make part of the park? Yes, um, yes and no. So we have done that. Uh, a, a great example is uh, Ramick Park in Council District 2 um, from the old IBM Hitachi site. Um, um, but a couple of quick uh, th um, points on that is, um, if when the park if the park is used for the uh, to drain the overall development, um, there would have to be a discussion between the Parks and Rec Department and Public Works and the developer about whether the developer receives park credit for that. So Ramick Park, um, they didn't receive credit for the softball field. Um, they went way above their obligation. So, um, so I guess the quick answer is yes, we have done that in the past in a few circumstances, a few instances where I'm aware of. Um, there's just a discussion with the developer about. Um, credit um, for the parkland um, that we would have to engage with. Okay, and, and not, again, obviously this is something that should be looked at at citywide sites, but as we design the new urban village at the Berryessa Park Station, there's the, that's the confluence of two creeks, right? Where Coyote Creek and, and um, Penitentiary Creek come together. And so, and there's a, a proposal for a large amount of green space with trails around those two creeks. Um, front that whole project and so we might want to look at, at that as that's being put together i know that's coming sort of the early stages are coming before the council next month but we ought to be uh um maybe looking at that site as well as a potential place especially because the water you know, the creeks are right there definitely design the parks to care, take care of their own storm water but the question of whether they take some more of the region storm water it's a great point we'll definitely look into those projects Okay. And then the, the question on roads, um, I was excited to see Monterey Road on the list because as I was thinking in my head, what are some great potential places to do this? Monterey Road sort of jumped into my head. The other thing I wanted to mention again, another district foresight, but because the new school is getting built and Zanker Road is a real, you know, not not the greatest of, of roadways and, and it, there's no greenery there along that stretch, they're going to have to rebuild the road around that school and the Tasman uh, area transportation plan is coming. Um, I think that there's a lot of potential for, for uh, trying to build that in as the road gets done, right? At, at, around that new site, around the Agnew School and that's getting built. Because um, I would, again, think it's better to build in the green uh, road as it's getting redone than it is to go back later and try to put it in. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I. Um, something caught my eye on the near term green street projects it was a little bullet point on the bottom that the average cost is 20 million dollars per acre feet i assume that's acre feet of stormwater captured um is that including the the repaving of the road or is that just for the additional cost of the the green street um, addition to the street when it's being repaved uh, that would be the total cost to construct that Green Street project, and it include the repaving of that project. It, okay, so, so for example, for West San Carlos, we're you know that's part of 
a repaving plan as it is. So I guess it would be it would be helpful to know kind of just what the marginal cost is as opposed to the entire cost. West St. Carlos is very long. Even just repaving it is multiple millions of dollars. Um, so taking that out would be would be helpful, I think, for us to to be better able to gauge these projects because we're already, as I've as I've talked about with the the urban greening infrastructure implementation plan, um, we're already repaving, right? And so that's kind of a sunk a sunk cost that we shouldn't shouldn't kind of count twice. Um, so I'd appreciate knowing that. It just made me think like if the you know the green component cost is one to two million dollars for West San Carlos Urban Village, what is the acre fee capture on that? Is it extremely, extremely small? Is that it is small and most like most of the green street projects, it will only capture and treat the runoff that fall on that street itself. So right. usually it's very small compared to regional projects where we can capture it from multiple neighborhood and take it to the pipeline and get to, to that location. So yes, that's the reason why it costs a lot more. Uh, and also for Green Street, most of the time, um, if, if the project is just repaved, then uh, it might not be a very good candidate and for, for Green Street. But if it's a reconstruction of the project, meaning we take out the curb, we take out the, the uh, the sidewalk, that's mm -hmm. a very good opportunity for us to come in and build some green street components into that. Uh, so the pavement itself might not be the main driving factor, okay. but the curb line, the um, sidewalk improvement, median island, those are areas where we really want to look into and take advantage of when, when a project has that. Right. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. And I, I also just want to point out, I think one of our um, public commenters, I think Josh mentioned this is, you know, it's the nice thing about these green street projects. I understand the the cost per acre feet capture is uh, relatively high compared to the regional, but it does, as, as council member Sparza also mentioned, it does add to the neighborhood and it helps with a number of other environmental issues in the areas and can, can add to um, the quality of life for the residents in those areas. So I, I appreciate this kind of dispersed um, strategy where we're doing big regional projects, but we understand that we can't only do regional projects to meet that one goal about stormwater capture. We have other goals as well. So I think I think having this um, having both a Green Street project and the regional capture um, strategy together makes a lot of sense and helps us advance our not only our climate goals, but our quality of life goals for our residents. Thank you again for this for this presentation. I appreciate it. Um, I think we are ready for this vote. Foley? Aye. Corrales? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Owen? Aye. And Davis? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We're moving on to item five, city generated toast services delivery model status report. That is a mouthful. Rachel. Just one moment, I think I've got it ready here. Can you see my screen okay? Not now again, yes. Okay, great. So good afternoon, Chair Davis and committee members. I'm Rachel Roberts, Deputy Director of Code Enforcement, and I'm here to provide you with a status update on the city generated tow services delivery model. I'm also here with Jennifer Chang, our Deputy Director from Finance, and Heather Hoshi, uh, DOT Division Manager. Excuse me. So as part of our uh, status report, I'm going to be providing you with a overview of kind of where we've been, where we're at, and where we're headed. Um, so we will be covering our work plan progress and outcomes to date. Um, we'll also be um, touching on the proposed work plan and the RFP scope revisions that we're proposing. And then uh, we will have um, a couple slides on our updated timeline for those key milestones and then our staff recommendation.
so the work plan progress to date, um, I put this into kind of a timeline for you. Um, we have uh, first uh, beginning in January of 2019, uh, where we brought forward uh, the audit of towing services and administration response. We got to work, as you well know, um, and um, pretty much kept a good pace between January of 2019 until March of 2020. So we had brought forward the Second Amendment to the tow agreements, the Council Policy Revision to, um, to Council Policy 9-8, um, and then provided two uh, committee status reports uh, to TNE, uh, one in November of 2019 and the second in February of 2020, where we outlined the framework and the implementation plan um, for our work plan. Um, and so then in March of 2020, uh, we came forward with, I'll turn off my video. Just a second, Council Member Foley, you need to mute. I think that's the problem. Okay, so um, in March of 2020, um, uh, with TNE's direction from the February 2020 status report, we came forward with um, a third amendment to the tow agreements where uh, we were looking to provide some financial relief to the tow operators in order to co uh, ensure con continuity of operations, but also to address some of the challenges that we had been seeing uh, up until that point. And um, it was at, on that same day that we actually saw the county shelter in place order um, was issued uh, to address COVID-19. So like with many other departments, this, this did shift our focus away from the uh, work plan as it had, was originally proposed. And um, as many of us were putting our efforts towards uh, the, the city's emergency response. Um, nonetheless, we were still able to uh, continue some of our work, um, but I've highlighted these in orange because these are really things that came um, out of that emergency response to the pandemic. So in June of 2020, we did bring forward a fourth amendment to the tow agreements um, that was to uh, provide further financial relief to ensure they would be able to continue to provide services to the community. Uh, and then the fifth amendment, which was really kind of just to give us that additional time to complete this work while we can still uh, maintain the agreements with the contractors and then also extend the amendments, which um, included all the uh, improvements we had already made uh, to the tow contract agreements and that service delivery. So these outcomes from the work so far, um, we've seen a lot of improvements in terms of communication and coordination. Um, we have had um, improved service delivery in terms of a, a significant decline in our tow refusals as well as late tows. Um, and then we've met, you know, been able to continue our tow services, as I mentioned, provide the financial relief to the tow operators. And we have been able to fully implement one and partially implement two of our uh, audit recommendations. So here is just a, a chart to show uh, that improvement um, in a visual way um, in terms of the breaches, um, specifically the tow refusals and the late tows. So you can see in 2018, um, the gray is the total number of breaches. Um, and these two categories tend to dominate those breaches. It tends to be the more common breaches that we do see, but you can see where we've moved from 686 in uh, the calendar year of 2018 for late toes down to 81 in 2020, and then 297 refusals down to three in, in 2020. And that's out of all uh, requests for tow services. So the revisions um, that we are proposing today, um, we're planning to keep the majority of the work plan intact in and the uh, framework for the, the service delivery model has been, had been proposed to you previously. However, we are finding that um, taking into account where we are today and the changes um, that have occurred over the past year and the, and the um, improvements we have seen, we do think it's appropriate to bring these two revisions to you today. Um, and so the first being that um, instead of doing a more formal pilot program step, we would instead go forward with the RFP and then um, implement the improvements to this tow service delivery model um, while we're in contract with that um, third party contractor who's going to be providing the tow, co uh, tow contract software and administration um, as an iterative process. So we can you know, test things out and then modify and continue um, as we get that contract in place and up and running. Um, and this would allow us to move that completion date up to February, 2022. Um, and then also um, as part of our RFP scope of work, 
um, and I provided this in the attachment of the memo, um, we are looking at adding a third option to that RFP scope, which would give the city the option to allow the third party contractor to subcontract directly with the tow operators. So this would take the city out of the role of having that contract with the tow operators, and that would be outsourced. And so we see this as um, something that's important for the city to have as flexibility. Um, we don't know what the market's going to bear just yet with, um, with this RFP, and we think um, it could provide some flexibility um, in terms of uh, options for the city, uh, depending on um, the, bid the bidding parties and where we think the best uh, model will be for um, the city and the tow contract services. And so some of those uh, projected outcomes of that proposed, those proposed revisions include an increase in efficiency, um, a reduced financial impact, um, improved communication and customer service, and then alignment with some of those key audit findings and recommendations. So the revised work timelines, um, work plan timelines that we are now looking at as a result of um, this delay um, that we experienced over the past year, um, as far as the original uh, work plan timeline. So we're now, um, we're actually in the process of um, developing the RFP scope of work. So that began um, and has been underway. And we're look, hoping for a release date in June, which would allow us to wrap up that part of the procurement by September. We would then bring um, to council in October for an award of contract to uh, permission to negotiate and execute that. Um, and then we would be focusing um, or targeting January 2022 to um, complete the contractor onboarding and software implementation. Um, and then also working to transition the program over to PD. And then of course, um, the, the process to improve the model as well as any negotiations that are needed with our current operators under our current agreements would continue on um, through that, that time period. Um, so with that, um, I'll conclude with our recommendation um, that you accept the status report of the city generated to a services delivery model and accept the revisions to the final implementation plan um, and the updates to the work plan timeline. And so I am available for any questions along with my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. I know council member Esparza has a scheduling issue. So I'm gonna call on her first before we go to the public. Go ahead, council member Esparza. Thank you, I appreciate it. I, um, and I just wanted to say thank you. I know this has been a lot of work um, and the pre-pandemic, we did see some positive changes. Um, given um, the, uh, the options uh, that we're adding and uh, basically my question is, what are the accountability measures? Basically, how do we ensure that toes aren't refused because we have one point of contact one rfp and and um i know that it's simplifying everything um but i i, I just want to um ensure that toes aren't refused and we don't go back to life before um these changes were made Thank you, council member. So we, um, again, this will be an option. It won't necessarily be the option we will exercise, but should we exercise this option, um, the intent is that, that uh, the city would set the standards, the performance standards and all the um, performance measures and expectations that the tow contract administrator would, would need to ensure those operators are adhering to. And so we would get regular data on um, their performance, as well as um, breaches, they would still have breaches in place that we will develop along with those automatic recommendations. So they're, they're basically, we determine those parameters and they just do the day-to-day -day monitoring for us. Okay, I, I, uh, my two cents is I think that it's great. I, I, our results are a little bit skewed, I think because of the pandemic, but we did see improvements beforehand. Um, so the three for 2020 is, is um, you know, it's great, but who knows what that's going to be like once, you know, I, I don't even want to say normal times because who knows what's going to be normal. Um, uh, and so, you know, I just wanted to put it out there. I'm okay with, you know, the, the changes in the fees and, and being able to have this be more financially sustainable for the tow operators, as long as we get the results that we want and that we need as a city. So, um, with that, um, 
actually, I won't make the motion because I have to run. <laughs> All, right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Esparza. We'll go to uh, the public comment. I think it's Blair. I'm not on that screen. Yeah. Go ahead, Blair. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Thanks for the item. Uh, I know you're working with the police department a lot on this issue. You've been working and working in the past few years on it now. Um, I've also, I've given my best attempts, uh, you know, a public comment every once in a while to try to mention uh, the ideas of uh, Palo Alto, who they've developed a really uh, interesting system, uh, you know, based kind of on human rights practices on how to deal with their tow issues. And I think it's to remind again, I hope you, you can really check it out and learn how to take its lessons and apply it to, uh, to San Jose. Um, it, you know, it, it, all, it can involve, you know, homeless people, people who live in their cars and, uh, you know, in the RVs. That's a real issue, um, like for around, you know, Mont Mountain View, Fremont, Berkeley, um, all those cities are having uh, issues uh, with that. And to learn important lessons is important. And I know Pacifica is having difficulties at this time with, with such issues uh, at, that relate to tow issues. And they're, they're arguing with the ACLU about that right now. And, you know, check out ACLU ideas on this subject. And I mean, anything to, to bring in good ideas and that can help the process in San Jose, which may be different than in other cities, but yet it's the same sort of issues. So good luck into our future of this and really look for, you know, real human rights ways to go about this as we are trying to, you know, uh, understand our lives at this time uh, with ideas of reimagine and so forth. And uh, good luck in how you go about uh, such efforts. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Turning back to my colleagues. Does anyone have comment I'll or question? Report. Thank you. Uh, I will second that. I have one question, um, Rachel. I think the timeline on your slides, maybe I misread it compared to the memo. It looks like the RFP, in the memo, it said the RFP was gonna be released in, in June. And I thought your slide said September? Yeah, so we're that? releasing in June, but we'll wrap it up in, in September. Got it. Okay, thank you. Uh, appreciate it. I was wondering if there was a delay, if I just misunderstood. So um, glad to hear that. So we should have responses back by by September. Okay. Yes, that's what we're hoping for. Yes. Got it. Awesome. Thank you. That was my only question. Appreciate it. I, I know this has been a <laughs> rethinking the the tow delivery or tow services is um has been a tough a sticky issue so i appreciate you doing all this work and i know it's was um kind of a strange thing to be thinking about during during the pandemic and i'm i know that uh i saw the one of my questions was going to be about the refusals on late toes but it was covered in the memo about the numbers didn't just decrease, the percentages of, of late tows and refusals decreased by quite a lot, even though the number of, of total number of tows went down. So that was a good, um, good thing to point out. I just wanted to point that out so that the public knew. And I think we are ready for the vote. Foley? Aye. Perales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We will move on to open forum. And there are a couple of members of the public who would like to speak. Roland, you're first. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'd like to very briefly follow up on the discussion you just had with the stormwater recapture and bring to your attention the uh, Santa Teresa Spring. Um, as a little bit of history, it was so named uh, because approximately 200 years ago, the Ohlone Indians were dying of lead poisoning because of all these paintings they were putting over themselves. And this lady in a black cape appeared in front of them, suggested they use the water from the spring and wash themselves. And guess what? The Ohlone Indians uh, stopped dying. Um, 
that spring was the source of the first uh, bottled water company in uh, San Jose and also the first swimming pool in Santa Clara County. And the reason I'm addressing you is because of the surplus crystal clear water um, uh, uh, coming out of this spring is currently being dumped in the storm drain on, on the Molina Drive and eventually finds its way to the, to the bay. What very few people know is that under the pond, the water district has considered what is known as a siphon, which has, was part of the aqueduct that was bringing the water from uh, Lake Anderson um, to Silicon Valley. And at little to no cost, we could reroute the water to the in, uh, eastern entrance of the siphon, at which point we would literally having dozens more of crystal clear, um, uh, sorry, acre waters of crystal clear water being rerouted to the Amadon percolation pumps instead of being uh, uh, dumped down to the bay. And the uh, last thing I'd like to bring to your attention, I don't know if Matt uh, is on the call, but I believe he and also uh, council member Jimenez are very familiar with the situation and I really like the city to uh, look into this uh, possibility as a matter of urgency. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Blair. Hi, Blair Beekman. Thanks for the meeting. Interesting meeting to try to get all my ideas in here. Um, one is uh, I, uh, good luck in how uh, surveillance uh, technology, uh, air monitoring systems and its surveillance, uh, that can be a good way to practice public policy ideas. Good luck in how to do that. Uh, I wanted to also comment that with the Vision Zero issues, um, you're, you're trying to find a new way to uh, gather statistics about KSI and, and accidents. Uh, good luck in how you can make that aware to the public and, and share that sort of information. You kind of tried today, it takes effort and work and we'll get the hang of it eventually. And I, just, I wanted to make light of it here. Um, to comment on, yes, on last week's uh, uh, PISPIS special meeting about domestic violence issues. It was a good meeting, you know, I, I learned a lot in reviewing it on YouTube. Um, you know, the question of peer review of the, poli of the police, uh, how they can peer review themselves after going through all the steps with the SEIU and, and mental health and, and you know, uh, local hospitals, that wasn't talked about. I mean, you're gonna have this big workshop coming up. Can peer review, police peer review, uh, you know, t is that part of this process? You know, and I, I think it can be really important and helpful and it wasn't talked about at all. Um, I hope I can address this more and, and I can have conversations with yourselves about this subject. To conclude, uh, last week at Rules and Upland Government, you know, for the third, fourth time, Chappie Jones interrupted myself while I was trying to speak on very important subject matter, I felt, but he treated my subject matter as if I was being too abstract and too Kid Joe and all that stuff. And I, I'm tired of that. I, I believe I'm offering, I'm trying to offer my best to offer relevant subject matter. And I hope he, we're both learning lessons how to respect that and the overall public meeting process. So thanks for your time. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>